Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to Scrutiny Subcommittee. Ah, there she is. We were waiting, just waiting for you. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> thought you'd gone to get a drink. Um, so welcome this evening. I'm your chair, Councillor Rachel Karnak. And uh, just to remind everyone, the role of this committee is to scrutinise performance and financial reports from across all the council services and make recommendations to Cabinet where necessary. This committee also deals with the call-in of Cabinet decisions and decides whether these decisions should be referred back to the decision maker to think again, but we won't be doing that this evening. Um, we actually have a really packed agenda this evening and, and you can see um, we have a lot of Cabinet members and a lot of officers here so um, we probably want to be quite uh, pithy. I know we want to um, drill down into everything, but I just ask everyone to be mindful that we have got some really meaty reports here tonight. And I know that a lot of you have had long days um, between licensing committee this morning and um, local plan working group this afternoon, as well as other meetings. There's no fire alarm planned, um, but should the alarm sound, please leave by the nearest available emergency exit. Two of the closest exits are through the glass door behind you to my left and through the double doors onto the riverside behind you. Please muster at Café des Amis. Members of the public are welcome to make their own recordings of the meeting using whatever non-disruptive methods they think are suitable. This meeting is being minuted, recorded and audio live streamed via the Council's website. The Westgate Garden gates on the riverside are locked after dark, so members of the public must leave the Guildhall by the, ne by the side exit behind the glass door. As I mentioned, we have Cabinet members here with us this evening, um, and we have um, Councillor Pip Hazelton, who is also going to cover for um, Michael Dixie and Mike Sol, who are both um, have given their apologies and unable to be here this evening. And we have Councillor Mel Dawkins and Councillor Charlotte Cornell. Um, and you may ask them questions um, during the course of the evening. Um, for their relevant reports um, when we come to them. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, yes, Chair, we do. We have apologies from Councillors Alistair Brady and Elizabeth Carr Ellis. And do we, ha do we have any substitutes? We do. We have Councillor Dane Buckman in for Councillor Alistair Brady. And do we have any declarations received in advance? Uh, no, we don't, Chair. So, are there any further declarations this evening? Nope. Gosh, can't use my fingers. Okay, um, right. So, um, we have the minutes of the meeting held on June 28th, because if you... If everyone recalls, um, they were um, forgotten at the last meeting. Um, so can we agree the minutes of um, the meetings as true record for 13th of September and 28th of June by General Assent, please? Thank you, that's carried. Okay, that's lovely. There are no public speakers for this meeting. And so, um, I'd like to move to item six, page 21 to 34, and this is to note the report of the Head of Policy and Communications. Um, Leo Whitlock is the presenting officer, but we also have um, Ellen Durling, Durling, who is Principal Policy Officer, Climate and Environment, who is going to speak this evening. And of course, we have Cabinet Member Councillor Mel Dawkins, who will be able to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is our annual report on our progress we've been making on the Climate Change Action Plan. Uh, and I'm just going to run through uh, a little bit about the report, just to summarise for you. Uh, we've had some, a number of challenges which will, will uh, stand out from the report. As ever, local government finance is always a bit of a challenge. Uh, and during the pandemic, our, our climate change reserve was taken away so, to, to ease our financial situation through that. Uh, and we've just uh, been, been managing our way through that. Uh, the government, the, the process for government funding is always a, a real challenge for us. It's often, quite often, a competitive process, uh, and we take part at cost if we need to get consultants or to collect evidence, and at risk of failing. So that is always a real challenge for us as a local authority that is, is challenged by our financial situation. We've had some challenges around our officer resource. 
Uh, and luckily, Ellen has agreed to join us from Kent County Council to step in uh, and fill that void. Uh, and some of our officers around the council have had their own challenges as well. If they've gone through the change programme, uh, an example would be in housing with our, our need to make sure our social housing is compliant. Uh, that, that all adds to our challenges. Uh, we've had some work, workload issues when uh, looking at big, big projects like the local plan that the team are involved with redrafting at the moment. Uh, but, there, but there are some uh, lights at the end of the tunnel. Uh, obviously, Ellen has joined us and she's looking after this area. We've managed to secure some extra resources, policy officers to support Ellen and some of her other policy work. Uh, so that should start to uh, take away some of the friction. Uh, we now have a cabinet member with a focus on, on uh, this agenda, uh, who's keeping our feet to the, to the fire. Uh, and I'm sure that climate change will play uh, a role in our forthcoming corporate plan. As officers, we're, uh, we're setting ourselves up to, with an officer working group to drive through that carbon emission cuts for our own operations and bring us all together to make sure we, we put our own feet to the fire. Uh, the budget, the current budget that's out for consultation suggests that we, uh, the, the 500 pound, sorry, not 500 pound at all, that would be far too little. 500K uh, reserve for climate and biodiversity is out for consultation at the moment, and that would help us with seed funding to get through those uh, government uh, funding competitions that we need to take part in to, to secure the funding. Uh, and that's being proposed at the moment and being consulted on. So uh, if people could like to take part in that consultation, we'd really welcome their views. Uh, carbon literacy, we're driving through for officers and councillors, and we've found some in-year funding to make that, make that happen. So watch this space. Uh, we'll be involving all of you along that in that role and we recognize still recognize our district-wide leadership role in trying to tr bring carbon emissions down across the district as you all know uh, the local plan the last local plan was a little controversial uh, and we've got a, a council working group now looking at the, the current local plan uh, and the sustainability climate change carbon uh, are all themes that are running through as we start to uh, look at again at that plan and again that will come out to, to consultation early in the new year uh, in the new year as well, we hope to start a review of the Climate Change Action Plan to make sure it's fit for purpose, we're measuring the right things, uh, it's adapted to modern life, as life changes around us, technology is changing all of the time, and we hope to involve councillors in that process with a workshop to take, your, take on your views, because I know a lot of you are interested in this agenda and have got a lot of expertise that we could tap into. On the, on the action plan itself, uh, we've made a lot of progress in certain areas. Some, some areas are still in progress and there are delays in others. So I'll just outline, outline those quickly, but there are in the report. Uh, workplace charging points, we've managed to complete that action. Kingsmead has received, is, or in the process of receiving £644,000 to decarbonise uh, that operation there. And PAS training has is, is been rolled, about, rolled out across lots of offices across the council. Uh, in progress is our move to our new offices, which will re reduce our carbon emissions. Our car fleet has been replaced with e EV vehicles. Uh, we're in the process of the Elvis House, 31 St Peter's Place, sorry, 31A St Peter's Place, known as the Elvis House. And that retrofit scheme is, is progressing, which will give us a real case study of uh, what works and what doesn't work in our sort of social housing. It's, it's there to teach us lots of lessons and take away the learning to make that process easier. Uh, obviously, I've said already that climate change and climate action is, is going to be a key part of our local plan, uh, our draft local plan that will be consulted on, and our draft transport strategy as well. And we, we, we recognise, like I've said, that, that, that district engagement needs to, to get underway. Delayed, uh, our green electricity supplier is, uh, has been delayed and is underway. We're still to look at our procurement emissions. We need to catch you some data about our home working, which has inevitably reduced our carbon, uh, our carbon footprint as a council. Uh, we're still working on our grant applications and getting ourselves in the best place for those when, when they arrive. And they often arrive very quickly and close very quickly, so we have to be very careful. Uh, we still need to look at our commercial, uh, solar and our commercial properties, uh, and we'll be working on that uh, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, Martin Hall in, in the environment team is, is starting to look at carbon sequestration through trees, but also uh, Mel's very interested in what we can do on the coast uh, in terms of seaweed. We need to decarbonise our commercial bu buildings. We need to look at Canenco's heavy fleet at some point, uh, and we need to look, uh, cons keep considering air quality. So uh, lots, lots, lots achieved, lots still to achieve, uh, and we're very happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much, Leo. Um, do we have any questions for um, the officer or for the cabinet member? Um, just to remind members that we're noting this report and it will then be referred to cabinet um, for noting along with the minutes of this meeting committee and any specific recommendations that we make and um, they will then look at resolving to review the climate change action plan um, right okay so um, councillor Turnbull first and then I'll come to you councillor McKenzie hi thank you very much for that um, Leo um, and it's great that you're here Ella <laughs> we're really looking forward to working with you um, obviously, you know, th we had grand ambitions when this when this was put into place, and um, it's it's a shame the circumstances have been such that we haven't achieved uh, what we wanted to achieve on this, and that's uh, a lot of it is very understandable. It's a shame because a lot of it was the actions for the first couple of years were about establishing where we're at and what we need to do and how we go about it, and we've, obviously we've lost a lot of that, so it feels like we're we're behind. But um, it's good you, you say that there are two new uh, offices how um, i'm curious to know how much they will be um allocated to uh, the this this agenda um and a i'm looking forward to obviously working on revising the plan that's going to be happening um the workplace charging you mentioned as well uh, is that um the staff um pay for that themselves do they that was just a small query i had about that um and that's it with me at the moment uh, our two policy officers are working across the gamut of our policy work because there is a lot on corporate plan, local plan, the climate change agenda, air quality, and our, our consultation and engagement, which is a which is a, a, an emerging theme from the, the new administration. Uh, but they're there to flex, and it's, it's more than we had before. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. So hopefully nobody takes it away. Uh, so I, I can't guarantee the amount of. of time i can't give you an exact time but they're there to support ellen when as and when she actually needs it when the peak, peaks of work are there thank you councillor mckenzie thank you chair um yeah so i wanted to ask from a from a ward level in uh story ward i know a lot of my residents are very concerned about air quality so i was very happy to see the revival of the air quality plan in 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 in, in this plan i was just wondering whether places with significant air pollution concerns like Sturry are being uh, uh, considered heavily in in the um, uh, the air quality plan reviews. And with the reopening of the Sturry Road Park and Ride, which I'll put on record, I'm very happy passed, but I do understand that residents will sometimes have concerns about air quality in the ward over the park and ride. So will there be monitoring for air quality uh, and 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 can there be a roadmap towards electrifying the park and ride buses? Uh, I know that's not possible in the near future, but but a roadmap or some consideration would be appreciated. Right, that's scarily out of our area in terms of transport and park and ride, but I can get you an answer on when our park and ride tender ends and when we look at the new fleet of vehicles. Uh, in terms of air quality action plan, we hope to re also renew that, review that in the coming weeks and months, so that that make sure that is fit for purpose. We're monitoring the right things and we'll take your views on board around Sturry. And Ellen might be able to tell me if Sturry is monitored already. And that Mel's waving her hand, so she probably knows. But uh, as part of the local plan consultation, we hope to bring a new air quality action plan because that's obviously ties in very, very closely with the transport strategy as well. Uh, pass over to Mel, because I think Mel. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, similar sort of thing. Uh, Sturry is in an air quality management area anyway. Um, so yeah, that will be within that. There are some new sensors going in, which I believe in winter mainly, um, they are supposed to be calibrated very soon to, so that you can check air quality on the Kent Air website. Have you all got access to that and seen that? Uh, Kentair.org, you can have a look at that. Um, that's like in partnership with Cardo. Um, so an air quality, um, like they do loads of sort of data research and stuff. And what was the... Sort of, yeah, but, you know, definitely let's keep talking about monitoring the area. The Starry Park and Ride, I would say that that would reduce the uh, the pollution, but, you know, we're waiting to see, and that's very much the transport strategy and the bluff sled strategy that um, is all being sort of talked about right now in the local plan. Thank you, Councillor Dawkins and uh, Councillor McKenzie as well. Um, the Park and Ride is going to come back to this committee in February next year. So um, we have yet to decide what we're going to look at. So that could 
be one of the things that we could add into that. And Councillor Howes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just to reply to the air quality with park and ride, we did see in the report when it came to us that air quality is actually going to be worsened by the park and ride because of the number of people predicted to be using it. But we'll come to that later. Um, Personally, there was a report published today which showed that one local authority has done a study similar to what you proposed, Leo, about the carbon footprint of home working, and it actually showed that the officers working at home increased the carbon footprint rather than decrease it, which was a surprise. But it's just, it was published today. I can't remember where I read it, but I'll send it to you when I see it. What I will also say is I'm really disappointed and I am really disappointed, but when we declared the climate emergency or climate crisis, we set very, very ambitious targets. And the biggest producer of carbon footprint within our districts are our assets, the houses. We know that we need to do a lot with our social housing. Disappointing that it's actually being taken out so we fit in with the government guidelines rather than the ambitious guidelines we chose. So it's, I find it very difficult to get my head around one target being set which was ambitious for our district because carbon is carbon it doesn't matter where it comes from we have got to do our best to eliminate it and tackle the problem if we're just going to pick and choose what we want to look at it seems a bit of a mockery so i don't know who's going to answer that yeah i, I don't think it's a mockery uh Ellen's been looking at our, our carbon footprint and making sure that we're comparing apples with apples with other local authorities and the way they work well, that's not to say we won't lose sight. We, oh, okay, oh, we, come back. We, were, we won't lose sight of that. We're not saying we're going to take that completely away. But what we're saying is we're trying to attack the carbon emissions that we we have direct control of first, and that's our 2030 target, and then take social housing and the emissions that come from that, which we don't have direct control of. We have lots of influence over, but not direct control, to over to 2050 that's more realistic and then we're likely to get there. It's not about a, a reduction in ambition. It's about trying to, to tackle what we can as quickly as we can in a tangible and effective way. I'll go back to our... And, and also, Ellen might have a better answer than me. But, but can I... Can, I, un, I understand the rationale behind it. And what I'm saying is it's still a mockery because we set a more ambitious target, including our emissions from... Yeah, which we do have an indirect influence over, and we can have a quite big influence over it. By taking out that bit, we're still tackling it. And I know it's a political decision and a political issue, to, so we can benchmark one area to another, but I just think it's wrong. I, I think the intention is to, to increase openness and accountability and transparency so you can measure us against other people. But I think Mel wants to come in and maybe Ellen. I just wanted to add that we are still committed to get all of council housing to an EPC of C or above by 2030, which is going to be a really big endeavour in itself. It's probably going to take the next two years just to get all of the EPC data on our housing stock from the position that we inherited it from East Kent Housing. So to then get all of our housing to an EPCC in the five years that follow that is going to be a really big challenge. Just to add to that, um Councillor House, um, yeah, so we took on the East Kent housing contract, as you know, which was in a complete mess, and we had to go around and do loads of repairs, like lots and lots of work that should have been done years ago. So that's where a lot of the resources gone for the last year or so. So this is now, so we're here where we are now, that we know that we need to have a stock, a housing stock survey hasn't been done uh, on any of this property, so we can't apply for grants until we know what we're applying for. You have to have an audit. So we have some good news as to, can I allow to say that? Yeah. Yep. So there's two um, posts going out for advert for two more surveyors that will do this work to go out and get the survey done as quickly as possible. And just heard from Councillor Hazelton, if they get um, recruited by the end of the year, they should have completed that complete survey within two years so that means we can start so maybe chunking off a certain amount a target every six months every year to get to apply for those grants that you know about anyway because you know the carbonation funds and all that stuff so we are re working really hard to do that we recognize that there was this issue before that needs to be overcome and unfortunately it was what we inherited okay is that okay councillor house 
it's uh, it's explained it, but I still, yeah, disagree. I mean, I I feel your pain. I mean, we all. I mean, I sit here and I know it. You know, everybody's <laughs> concerned about an environment we've heard today and yesterday about the three Celsius possible rise if people the world doesn't get their act together. So it is very challenging, but we have to work within our means, don't we? Okay, thank you. And um, do we know what the average EPC at the moment is? Do we have any idea? No, Very low. Not off the it's marine white. So that might be something then to come back in a future report. Um, whichever one that is, I know we've got housing coming up this evening. So maybe either between climate change or um, housing, we could actually monitor how we're doing on, on the audit and the EPCs. So obviously it's a major issue, not only for our housing, but all housing, especially in the private rented sector at the moment. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Watkins. Eureka, thank you. Sorry about that. After all that, I was just going to say, I've, I've got something I want to say about the, the housing target, but I've got some other general comments. Am I allowed to speak twice or only once on this paper? Okay, so let me do it back to front then. I'll talk about the housing and then I'll come back later to, to my other general comments. I, uh, you know, a, a, actually, what, what Joe has said is, is, is the, the, the item that you know, I, I have most concern. I have very strong concern about dropping housing from our climate change uh, target. Um, you know, when we set this up with Nicholas Thurston, who was our officer for three years, uh, and um, you know, Ellen has, you know, e extremely strong credentials. Anyone who knows Nicholas Thurston would say he has extremely strong credentials from the Canterbury uh, Kent University environmental scientist. And he did a huge amount of research to look at what scope one, two and three emissions should be. And, and, and uh, everyone agreed that this council that we should include council housing emissions within our target. Now, you know, the, the practical side here is if you take something out of a target, of course, it doesn't have the same focus. You can still do work on it, but it just inevitably doesn't get quite the same uh, visibility and focus. Um, and to, to, to sort of maybe counter Leo's point a little bit, uh, that these are our buildings and we do control their emissions because we control what insulation they have. We control if they have solar panels or if they have gas boilers, electric boilers or heat pumps. So, you know, we control them just as much as we control what our staff do in our office in making decisions about the temperature and the aircon, right? Um, so I, I really don't see any reason that we should carve that out. And, and if other districts, some other districts are, are saying, well, we don't include it, I'm like, well, I don't agree with them. Frankly, whichever party is running them, I just don't agree with them. So I really think we, we should try and be leaders in this field. And I really think it is important, especially as we've got, got the data. You know, we, we've got the data from the audit we did in 2019, 2020 for the emissions from housing. And we just need, I, I just think we should be looking at every year. Um, and I know it's really tough. It's the hardest bit of all the assets we, ha we, we own to decarbonise. But I, I really do think we have the control um, to make serious uh, reductions in their, in their uh, carbon pollution. And, and I'd, I, you know, I'd be interested to get Mel's view on, on why we would really remove this when we both care so much about decarbonising those council homes. Thank you, Councillor Watkins and Peter. Yeah, um, just, just to be clear, the, what's been presented is the current, current action plan. The, the change, any changes being recommended to the action plan to come through at a later date. So that's still to be looked at and, and agreed by Cabinet at, at a later date. So the recommendation, which it says in the report to Cabinet, will be to consider whether a review of the Climate Change Action Plan is, is needed. And then that, that can be considered at that time. And there'll be another opportunity to, you know, for, for councillors to discuss what is in and what is out. Um, I would say, obviously, this has been on the agenda since we declared the emergency and there's 
progress on this is very much dependent on housing side is very much dependent on what the government funding is and we apply for government funding we're successful on some of it we're less successful on other parts um, and we use that and we we still do we're still working towards that so the the climate change aspect or the retrofitting of, of its ex existing stock is hardwired into the hra business plan and therefore will continue regardless of whether it sits within the climate change action plan or not um the, the real issue is accessing the funding um, to be able to do it en masse. And actually, we're, we're doing really good stuff on building. You know, we've, we've got the new development over at Riverside, which I, you know, I appreciate I'm preaching to a converted on this, and you, you know all this stuff. Uh, um, but we you know which had uh, the heat source pumps and, and stuff built in within it, and it's done to high standards. So there's lots of work still going on with that. But the HRA is very fragile, and you, you see that, and you know that as as uh, as councillors through the, the budget that's gone through as well. Um, so we, we're still very much dependent on delivering this through external external funding. We will not stop looking for the external funding, and we will still use what resources we have to retrofit where we can. And the the Elvis House, which I hate calling it the Elvis House, but it's, if you've used 31A, no one knows what you're on about, and um, will hopefully be a, the, the sort of standard that we're setting. And one of the key things that we're using the UK SPF funding for, which kicks in next year, will be about working with the colleges to actually develop skills within that sector. Because, and again, I know you know this, but others might not. Actually, the skill set around retrofitting is is one of the, the things that's really tricky. There's lots of builders out there who can build from scratch up to the standard, but actually using the skills to retrofit um, uh, housing to to a higher level of, of what we would want through through um, that is a lot trickier. So again, there's lots of stuff we need to do locally to actually build resilience within uh, the the system before we can even deliver on some of this stuff even getting the money doesn't mean we can deliver on it so there's a number of things at play and i think it, it's not about deprioritizing it at all i think it's about where we can throw the focus in to get as much done by 2030 and i think what you know to, to simplify it from my point of view spreading our, ourselves too thin means we don't do anything because we're, we're sort of constantly trying to spin plates rather than actually say what is it we're targeting on trying to deliver so um, it probably refocuses, but it doesn't take away at all, I don't think, from, from what the action plan is trying to deliver or, in general, a council sort of committed to delivering between 2030 and 2050, depending on where you see stuff sitting in, in that uh, grand scheme of things. Thank you, Peter. And, um, yes, Councillor Dawkins. Uh, and, yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm not, but, but my, the report, the action plan is not by no means... Um, demoting the priority of the housing it's just sort of separating it out and it's all maybe Ellen might want to extend a little bit because of that carbon emission data so it was very very high so it could be that we you know this is all open to debate as well it's a consultation coming out so we can bring that up and definitely should but but for me and I'm working closely with uh, Councillor Hazelton here is very that's part of you know it's pretty much your number one priority isn't it um, to get the housing retrofitted so it's definitely going to be more work going on sort of jointly to get this done so it's just about how you approach it so rather than packing it in all in one package just sort of separate them and look at them as two different things and then otherwise as uh, Peter says you're just spreading yourself too thin and you're not going to get anything done I don't know if you want to explain a bit more on that or should we just stop this with my <laughs> the uh, uh, service director for place no people people it's just helpfully inform me as well that we're, we're ready for the next round of funding from the government to apply for it we've got she's found budget for match funding as well so it's not a, it's not a priority when the opportunities come we're going to take them with both hands ellen did you want to say anything yeah i think it's just i guess to reiterate it, if if we put all of our resource into housing which outweighs a lot of other stuff in terms of emissions then we wouldn't be able to get done what we're obliged to do by 2030 so it's just about kind of trying to be a bit more pragmatic but also just to point out that we're undertaking a review of the greenhouse gas emissions and we're hoping to develop quite an interactive dashboard which will have our 2030 emissions but we are also going to create something similar for housing on its own um, so it's it's not that we're taking our focus off of housing it's just being more um, sort of pragmatic about it thank you and I, I think that i think that's probably a really important thing that um, in looking at the climate change action plan um, that yeah we that we should be setting the bar high not coming down to what 
other authorities are doing because we were one of the first to do any of this. Um, and although it's been a really difficult time with the pandemic and East Kent housing coming in, I still think we need, probably everyone feels that we should keep working to the highest level. So I think it needs to be in there some way um, so that as a committee, we're able to also look at that coming through. So, you know, even if it's as a adjunct, I think it would be good if it goes to cabinet um, that we need to have that information in some format. And Councillor Prentice. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just picking up on the question earlier, um, asking about the number of surveyors we have working on our council housing estate at present. Um, I would like to know what will the full strength of that team be when we have recruited enough surveyors so that we can achieve the targets we want to reach? What, what capacity increase would that represent with a full team in place? Um, thank you. Uh, the answer is that I, I, we, I don't think anyone will know that off the top of their no, head. But we can... Alexis is there. Oh, I was just... <laughs> we need more chairs. Yeah. Yeah. We currently have one stock condition surveyor um, working on our, our stock, but we are going out to recruit for two more. Um, hopefully, we'll get the adverts out before Christmas, so that will treble our resource and bring down the time that it will take us to get the stock condition surveys done across our 5,000 plus properties to two years. So that, that's what we're working towards. So we'll have three in place eventually when all are recruited. Thank you. That's... Thank you. Are you volunteering? I have no expertise. <laughs> uh, Councillor Jeep first. Hi, uh, mine's going to come across as a little bit facetious after those excellent questions. Um, it's about the Elvis House. Um, I just wondered whether it was going to be publicised, what's going to happen with it. It is a local landmark and I think in order to get the public on board with anything retrofitting, it's a good use of advertising space. Um, will it be publicised? Because also it's interesting. Uh, thank, thank, thank you for, for, for that. Yes. So um, the officer who's in charge of the, you know, the, the re retrofit, um, there's a lot of, there, there are plans to, I'm not quite sure whether it's a camera that sort of, you know, fast forwards, but um, to, to film it basically as it's being retrofitted so that it'll be um, available for the public to see. And I also think that it'll time be... Time-lapse. Sorry? A time-lapse. Time lapse. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Duke. Yeah. yeah, so I think that there are certainly built into the whole project is ways of capturing the learning as well as publicising, um, you know, the work as it goes along so that, so that it, that will be available for us all to all to see and I think it may even be disseminated out to uh, colleges and uh, you know in terms of gaining the skills for for retrofitting that was alluded to earlier thanks we could go on YouTube and then uh, for other councils to learn from us uh, councillor Watkins <laughs> thank thanks chair yeah so I'll, I'll I'll say what I was planning to say uh, 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 up front and uh, therefore it will be a lot more positive than my last interjection so um, yeah I mean, uh, firstly actually it's great to, to have uh, uh, Ellen in post and I hope you've enjoyed your uh, initial weeks at the at the council it was my great pleasure to be uh, lead councillor on climate change until the the May election um, and very much wish uh, Mel well in uh, critical endeavor working with you um, i've just got some 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 points and a couple of questions at the end um uh, first thing to say was actually our district target isn't 2050 it's 2045 and you might remember that about two years ago we signed the uk 100 pledge which was for really ambitious and progressive councils to go further and faster so i believe uh, you look through the um the uh, the minutes of those meetings you'll see we're actually trying to get our district to achieve uh, 2045, not 2050. But don't worry, we didn't sign up to 2025 for the council. 
um, but we should get that corrected. Uh, just another quick correction. You know, we were trying to set up our own uh, solar farm in, in Greenhill, which is my own ward. Um, and so I was very involved with the project, working with Canterbury and Kent County Councils. And the report says that Kent changed strategy, and that's why we weren't able to do that. Actually, it's a little unfair on Kent County Council because it was Vattenfall who owned the electricity substation down there. They changed their strategy. They wouldn't let us connect that solar farm that we were going to build as the council. And then, therefore, the project couldn't happen. So, Ken, yeah, they did change strategy, but because Vattenfall did. Um, and I just say to you, Ellen, if you weren't that involved with that during your time at Kent County Council, I think um, you know, that project could still be done, but we're, you know, we have to see um, what, what Vattenfall or, or whoever they may actually dispose of that site to do. So I, I think that's one for the future, maybe, because it would be wonderful if we had some directly generating solar assets for this for this council um, i've got some ideas for what we can do to achieve more solar on the roofs of some of our large buildings like you know with industrial units we let in Wincheap, uh, or you could take the bowl bowling center at whistable harbor but i'll just email you about them separately because uh, i like to try and be practical and, and useful um, i said my bit about about housing i just think there we should work cross district because the other districts have got the same challenge it is really hard to decarbonize council housing i i accept exactly why it's been a struggle and and so much of what peter yourself uh, and mal said is, is right although i personally think it should still be in our target as you as you know um and my two questions one is the five hundred thousand pound climate change reserve is that one off or is that is the intention that that's every year so a fresh half a million pounds every year uh, and secondly um this is climate change, but air quality is very close, you know, very, very close to climate change. We had a full time officer who was, was Kelly Haynes uh, and, and she, she left the council some of the time to, to, to Nicholas Thursden. Um, is it my understanding that we've only we're only recruiting for a half person, sort of part time, half FTE resource in, in air quality? Um, obviously, the, the incremental resource for climate change is fantastic. But, but we might be, you know, taking with one hand and gaining with the other. So just like to get clarity on that. They were my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Um, who is going to answer those? Leo? Yeah. I can talk about the air quality posts. Uh, on the policy side, Ellen, it's, there's no sleight of hand, so I'm not trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, Ellen's going to look after the policy side of it, and it's a practical the post that's being advertised as a practical post, doing the monitoring, the measuring, and out on the ground doing the concrete batch pub concrete plant checking and monitoring and petrol stations and that sort of stuff. Uh, I think it, it's budgeted for an initial full-time post, but I think the team have struggled to recruit to that post. So I think they're trying a different tactic, but we'll keep pushing to make sure we've got the, the full resource that we need. Uh, in terms of the reserve, I think it's it's a one-off. Yeah, I think Nikki was going to have a fit with a leg up. Uh, and it, it's it, gone. Yeah, it, it's not a one-off, it's a reserve. So it's there until it's spent. It doesn't it doesn't disappear at the end of the year. So that's different to how our normal budget. If it was £500,000, it wasn't there at the end of the year, it might go. But this is the same 500000 that was put in at the beginning when the climate change emergency was declared. It obviously went when we had the, the COVID emergency and then we, we built up the um, general fund something fund that was going to stabilization fund thank you <laughs> um which was everything was pulled together now nikki uh, is working through disaggregating that so that reserve goes back out specifically to be for the, the climate change and, and the biodiversity emergencies that we've declared so it's back in as a dedicated fund and it's there until it runs out um but hopefully once finances get into a better shape we're, we'll look at how we can build and put money into that reserve each year so we're sort of trying to hopefully get into a tread water position. But it's also not the only pot of money being used to deliver it. And I think, as we said earlier, there's money that's being used by housing. There's money that's been used um, when we did active, active life stuff um, recently. That was, that was money outside of using that. So this is really for the something coming along where we need to use it, um, where it doesn't fit within a normal services operating budget. So it's the sort of uh, rainy day fund for the opportunities that come up for this rather than a ongoing use of, of money in that sense. Yeah, thanks for the answers. Just to say, um, I, actually, I do think the report is a very fair summary of where we are, frankly, you know, on the on the climate change side. So, um, you know, my thoughts on housing, but I mean, actually, I think it is a fair 
uh, summary status of, of where we've got to. So uh, thank you very much for uh, preparing that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Councillor Watkins. And you know, if we went, when we get this workshop, this council workshop, I really hope that you're on that uh, that group. So I appreciate your input. Um, yeah, the UK 100. Yeah, I needed to follow that up. As I, as you know, I went on that course this time and and just about to graduate. Um, so yeah, I do need to um, follow that up with the UK 100 and make sure as well that we put that on the website properly <laughs> and um, that it's part of uh, our um, sort of on those links there. Um, I'm not sure, and I'll talk to Ellen separately about that further faster 2045 target. Um, but yeah, in terms of the solar and or making utilising our roofs, I have done a little <laughs> bit of digging with that, and I'm really interested in the community solar thing. And I know you're, you've just become a director, haven't you, of com Kent Community? So I have been reaching out to a different organisation. Not necessarily going to go with them, but we're going to meet them in the new year. And sort of, uh, they've done quite a big mapping exercise already about not. Uh, they've mapped the whole of Canterbury district to to and um, you know come up with a figure of how if you could put solar on every single roof, what you. I think it was like nearly 50 uh, giga, gigawatts. Sorry, it was quite a high amount, but I mean, obviously you would have to get permission to do like that. But I'm interested to talk to you more about community solar anyway, because there's a lot of uh, detail there because it's quite, there's a lot, the legislation has to change, doesn't it? To make it easier to have those, sub, to use the substations. So you don't have to go all the way around the grid and all this sort of stuff. So it's quite complicated and I'd like to know more about it too. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, thank you, Councillor Watkinson. Uh, Councillor Castle. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick one. Apologies if this is easy accessible, but on the public climate action plan at the moment, um, obviously tonight we're talking about all KPIs, bin rates and all sorts. There's no financial data. I know we've talked about like EPC and it's going to take two years to get the data. Would that be possible when we do the new climate action plan to have the physical cost to the council? Because if it's £27 million, then obviously that would be a you know there's a lot more wins i know you talked about prioritizing things but i think the public document just has a lot of priorities a lot of people the average joe would look at it and not necessarily know the cost implication and that has a big impact on public opinion and the optics of how we move forward with things thanks yeah i we can definitely um put that through um so we'll we'll add that at the end then as as a request i think that's a i think that's a good point um yeah i mean a lot of it has been through trying to oops, trying to match fund um but but i think i think you have a good good point what does it cost exactly so yeah we'll we'll come we'll do that at the end so councillor house yeah, thank you it's just a really small point about the paper it's, it's a really good report but i'd like to go back to something councillor duke said everybody knows the elvis house can we not rename it the elvis house because when you see the proper address most people haven't got a clue where it is but people do know where, where the Elvis house is. So can we go through officially naming it? I'm sure that's Councillor Hazelton. Because I... I'm, I'm happy to take that back to, uh, to Cabinet. Thanks very much for the suggestion. Get a big fat Elvis impersonator to open it. Yeah, I've, I've been, I was researching Elvis songs as well with the, about housing as well so i think there's a couple he's done a couple of songs so that we could have a theme tune as well perhaps i was costello more than elvis presley yeah elvis costello yep yeah, we'll give um councillor dupe you can have the credit for that <laughs> it will be minuted right okay do we have a yes councillor buckman Yes, yeah, so, so just quick, just to carry on about the solar panels thing, because obviously there's we've got this heritage areas and the conservation areas. Um, will that restrict the sort of solar panels and the, the um, energy efficiency of homes that we can do because it's in this sort of area? That one for Ellen. It would be very much a case by case basis is the only kind of answer I can think to say really. Um, I, I, we do have a large amount of heritage buildings, but that we also have plenty of other buildings. So it, it would just be a case by case basis. Yeah, I think, um, I know it's, it's a balance, isn't it? Any final questions or comments on the climate 
change action plan. If not, um, then I'd like to uh, thank the officers um, very much for being here this evening and to um, Councillor Dawkins as well. And just to recap then, um, we uh, want to, we would like to know the cost to the council of the climate change action plan when that comes back again. I think this comes annually. Yes, this is, this is an annual report, yep. So um, that will be next year. Um, and um, also um, average EPC and, and the updates on the housing, um, air congestion, air quality and uh, air quality, um, Sturry and the park and rides, which will probably bring Councillor Mackenzie, if you remember that, then that we can talk about that in February, I think, probably add that in. Um, and then uh, more information on the um, teams as well, surveyor team and um, the air quality team as well. And I think going to the review then that we just um, say that uh, we're not, this committee's um, not that, not happy about social housing and private lets being removed from the data and we'd like the cabinet to look at that particularly and really decide should we be best in best district or should we be the same as other districts um, and and that we want to commit to our um, commit to the climate emergency that we passed in 2019 and also, Councillor Watkins' points will be minuted, won't they, as well? And also, Councillor Jupe, as well, will we'll minute that. So you're, I know, <laughs> I know, well, you'll go down in posterity. Um, so on that note, I think that's everything. Does everyone agree with that, just general assent? Is that all OK going through? Right, great, lovely, thank you. So thank you, Leo, thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Councillor Dawkins. Right, we now move on to our next item, which is um, the Leveling Up Fund quarterly update. And again, we're noting the report of the Head of Digital Data and Improvements, Caroline Marlow. Um, so, and we have uh, Councillor Charlotte Cornell here this evening as well. And this is item seven, which is pages 35 to 56. Um, thank you, Caroline. I'm not really sure how to follow the Elvis um, exclamation. So, um, in the uh, in the interest of pithiness, um, I'll just I'll just do a, a few notes from the re the report. It's the, the standard template um, that the committee is is becoming accustomed to seeing. Um, we have included um, updates on the areas that were requested last time. So, if there is any questions or comments on those, or indeed anything else, I'm happy to speak uh, to answer questions on those. Again, with with uh, Councillor Cornell, apologies, or indeed Councillor Hazelton, who I understand is also in here to, in in place of Councillor Sol, because um, under the the project remit, although this this very much crosses both uh, Councillor Cornell's uh, and Councillor Sol's remits, too many remits. Um, so I mean, broadly to today, and I I'm always wary of hubris, but once again, touching wood, it's still going quite well. It's still going largely to plan. Our budget and expenditure, looking at Nikki, because I don't want one of those fierce looks uh, that Leo got earlier, um, that, that we are on track with our expenditure. We've had to, to jiggle one or two things around, uh, but all within the, the envelope and the overall timeline. Once again, that the overarching kind of risk remains the, the short uh, duration of the project. We need to be completely completed with the DLUC funding by March of 25. That's the, the jiggling around that we did, which is we, we've moved some of our own match funding to, 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 to after that March date, but that works at the moment in terms of our plan. So since we last updated you, we have undertaken and completed the highways consultation. Feedback on that is currently being analysed, so um, you'll get uh, updates on that in the, the next quarter. We've submitted our listed building consent and our scheduled monument consent for both uh, 
the Poor Peace Hospital, aka the Kit and the Castle. I'm hoping many of you uh, will have seen the castle is now smothered in scaffolds, and we are um, we managed with a fantastic job of work by the scaff guys. And I was excited; I got to wear a hard hat and high vis on site. Um, they managed to get the about 90% of the scaffolding done before we had to cease works due to um, the ecologists' um, recommendations or um, instruction uh, due to the possible presence of bats um, but they managed to get a fantastic job of work done there so we've only got the external ghastly elevation that will need to be to be finished when the weather warms up um, so that's fantastic because it does mean that we can continue with the stone by stone survey which is very very important because once you know we can't do anything in terms of developing that site until that's been completed so that's that's actually really good news given the circumstances. And it's nice because it's something really tangible that, that people are able to start to see um, and comment on. So that's happening. Um, we've still got un uh, ongoing feasibility reports nearly back, I think, on the bike hire scheme. And we've that's, that, again, will come back to the next committee. Um, and I suppose the biggest uh, kind of news is that obviously we have appointed HTA as the design, the core design team. They have begun now to draft early concepts for the key spaces, the gardens and such. Um, we are, we've, they, they've done some fantastic consultation work with key stakeholders, with councillors, with the disability advisory panel, uh, to name many. Um, and from what I've seen, early doors, they are really reflecting the comments and feedback of those communities, which is very exciting. Um, but you will all get to see those in January. We're having a three, three week, I think, 8th till 26th ish of January. It's in the report um, display in the beanie. And we're also going to be undertaking various kind of one to one stakeholder consultation feedback, lots of surveys. We are we're going pretty heavy on the consultation. We're trying to get as much feedback as we can because you know, these design stages are obviously fundamental. And at some point the decisions will be taken and then there's it will all just be digging and I'll have very little to say other than here's a picture of the next bit. Um, so this is really, really important for us across all of those different strands of the project. But yes, there'll be lots that we'll be consulting on publicly in the new year, which is very exciting. I'm sure there'll people have lots and lots and lots of opinions and that's when my job gets tricky. But uh, for now, everything is pretty... More wood touching. Everything is, is on track. Um, I will stop there because I could talk forever and I've been told to be pithy, but obviously any questions you may have, please do. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, yes, Councillor Prentice. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have two questions, um, but I'll do one at a time. Um, my first question is um, around one of the strands to the project, which is around protecting and repairing the historic assets in our city. Um, one question is around the uh, King Ethelbert statue on Lady Wootton's Green. Um, uh, been informed and been to see for myself that it has a little bit of damage. I wondered if there was any prospect of um, some repairs to the concrete plinth underneath the statue. Ethelbert's not looking wobbly at the moment, but um, we obviously want to be able to um, predict and protect before it becomes a problem. Obviously, there is a considerable budget for uh, protecting heritage assets, and I just wondered if Ethelbert could see some um, TLC. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prentice. And um, being the ward councillor of Rukulva, then uh, yes, <laughs> I, I think Ethelbert needs a lot of protecting. So who wants to answer that? Charlotte or Caroline? My um, quick answer would be there is not currently any provision in the budget for it. Um, and yes, there's a considerable budget, but there's a considerable amount that we're doing. That doesn't mean to say that we couldn't take a look at it um, and come back with a it's possible or it's not possible, but certainly happy to, to look at that, seeing as we are undertaking those types of survey works and so forth. So actually, in terms of economies of scale, if there are other things that we can reasonably, and, and my big thing is trying not to delay this programme, but if we could add things on where we'd get more benefit from that, from the same contract or the same work, then I don't see why not to look at, to look at it. OK, thank you. And uh, Councillor Mellish. Um, excuse the, the ward between us. Um, sorry. Uh, so, there you are, Caroline. Um, just given that there are time constraints, uh, given the, the LUF uh, funding, 
just a simple question, really. Have you put any leeway in, just in case there are archaeological uh, discoveries are made, in, particularly in terms of the landscape and the sort of study of the sites, because given Canterbury and Canterbury and Canterbury, you know, uh, there's at least a back to the Roman period, not before. Uh, so, uh, but again, that may, may delay either funding or, 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 or time for these projects. Yeah, I won't try and bend around and see you and speak into the microphone. My my um, my diction's not that good. Um, have I built in any leeway? Not really. It's just not really been possible to build in leeway within the sort of eighteen months we've got for the dig. I think what we what we are um, really really cognizant of all the way through is that. At any point, there may be there may be a showstopper on one or more of the sites, which is why we have reserve sites. So I suppose the, the contingency or the leeway is in that regard. Um, we have we have flex or we've got contingency, I suppose, in terms of ensuring to be really technical about it, that we reach our uh, 20 outputs and nine outcomes or whatever it is that we've said we will do. We've, we've you know, we've kind of. Uh, sold over capacity if you like um so we we should be able to land there and hopefully there won't be showstoppers within those those key sites and if that is the case then what we will also have is a legacy of additional works that can be done or funded laterally sorry councillor cornell thank you i think just to echo a little bit what caroline says whenever i meet up with caroline the first thing she says to me is there are no show showstoppers you know stop don't have a heart attack today <laughs> but but we are in canterbury we will likely hit some something at some point, hence the reserve. But the HTA and uh, some of the sites we chose and in discussions with the diocese, which are the owners uh, of many of the sites chosen, we were aware of the subterranean interventions and so in some of those more sensitive sites, we're not going deep um, because of that awareness and discussions with the diocese in advance. In terms of um, if something is discovered, I mean, it, it can be another benefit for the city in terms of, you know, that can, can then be exploited, as it were, perhaps after this project is, 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 is finished. But again, perhaps we need to sort of have leeways or some sort of reserves to take that anything that is discovered further forward. And we very much were aware that when we were talking about story gardens, they didn't have to be literally on top, that we, we were looking at uh, spaces inside and sometimes the sub subterranean offer, much of which we don't know what that is. Um, so if we did hit a showstopper, I'm sure the considerations would be, how can we best preserve this for the benefit of the community? Yeah. And I think that's a, a really important point as well, that the LUF is only the start of this project. Um, this project is meant to endure and hopefully um, gain extra funding over the years. So it, it is just a start, not an end. Yes, Carol. Sorry, just to, to labour that one a little bit further. It's one of the benefits that I have found as the kind of project lead for Canterbury City Council, as compared to my colleagues in different districts who are working very much with a, a fixed site or there's a fixed a building or such a thing and actually there is no flexibility i remember when we were building the beanie you know we found some roman jewelry and so and and, the, and again with the marla there were lots of things which did delay it it's not in the same way i suppose quite as constricted so that's where all of my colleagues are very envious at the moment <laughs> Uh, hence why when you raise Ethelbert, you know, it, it, it's something there that we can look to as part of the wider parcel when we do hit these um, ha deviation moments within the greater portfolio. <laughs> uh, well, we know where he is now, though. <laughs> thank you. And Councillor Howe. Yeah, thank you. Just following on from Councillor Prentice, and uh, something which does need a bit of repairing, according to Historic England, is the Dane John Mound. So I need to ask a question, are you just going to provide an update and how that might impact on it? Um, uh, the, the listing of the Dane John Mound on Historic England's at-risk register was useful for us. Uh, uh, it, it was already identified and our engineers were already scoping interventions. It's a lot of wear and tear and erosion and footfall and it, so many people love it and so many people want to surmount the mount that, that it, 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 it becomes a victim of its own success. Um, so, yes, the engineers and the design team are very aware that the mound is a, a priority for the Dane John element of our, of, our, of our site, of our design, of our intervention. I've, I've discussed um, 
after meetings with the Canterbury Archaeological Trust, I fired off last week, I fired off a couple more emails to Caroline for further considerations on scoping um, the, uh, well, what it is. The, it being placed on the at-risk register may, in the long run, unlock wider funds as well. Um, so perhaps we can best, best protect the mound if we do some scoping work on what the mound really is whilst we also, using the levelling up monies, open up access, open, open up interpretation and cite it e even better within the space. Thank you. And do we have any final questions? Yes, Councillor Prentice. Thank you. And then my second question um, was about the bus station works. Um, I think next year is allocated, I think it's the second part of next year, is allocated to some of that renewal work at the bus station. My question really is about how that is managed. And obviously, we've got a very constrained site um, with not a lot of room to shift things. If, for example, we're replacing the bus shelters and doing things with street furniture and so on and so forth. My question is really, have conversations been had with Stagecoach and any of the other bus operators using it as to how that work is managed? And do we need to find any alternative arrangements? Because obviously, one of the key concerns is for bus passengers coming in and out of a really key transport hub in East Kent. And we want to make that departure and arrival experience as easy as possible, despite the fact that we know we've got to do a load of work there. Um, again, the brief answer is yes and yes. Um, we've been speaking stagecoach since the beginning. Um, it is it, it's slightly slower than I suppose something over which we have got complete autonomy because they obviously own the site and, and we have to take into account all of those considerations but yes from the beginning we have said we will need to look at alternative provision we will need to look at what works I think we are not there yet and there was quite a, uh, some energy on social media recently when uh, we had the highways um, drawings out which actually was fine, it kind of stimulates things, but uh, but we are not at the stage where we have draft drawings or designs for that space, which would in the first instance anyway need to be agreed with Stagecoach from a kind of practicability um, stage. And then we would need to look at how that, that work is scheduled in. So we're very, very aware of it. Um, it's it's to, to a large extent, it's their site, but lots of the things that we are proposing are very much in keeping with their ambitions and in Indeed, a, a lot of it, in particular, the, the notion of kind of potentially looking at the, the bus shelters has come from the accessibility panel who have said it's incredibly difficult to, to traverse. Um, and, and so we're looking at that from a really practical perspective and then somebody cleverer than me will make it pretty. But yes, we are, yeah, we're absolutely kind of hand in glove with, with Stagecoach and hopefully that will continue to be smooth also. Thank you. And Councillor Castle. Sorry, Caroline, can I just clarify the bus, the bus shelter document was shared quite widely with parish councillors where I live and there was a removal of some of the roofing. So that's still going to go back to consultation again. I'm sorry if I've got my wires crossed. No, that's fine. So that was the high. So part of the highways. It, it's but a we'll bit, go out yeah, again. this was the 12 week statutory highways consultation yeah. wherein we're proposing potentially widening carriageways and, and doing bits and bobs with the sort of infrastructure, if you like. I'm not very good with the vernacular. Um, we indicated what, that there may be some changes to that, but those were not the designs of the bus station. It's a really difficult thing to get right because we needed to include it for context, but it's not going to look like any of those things. And that's not really, it's more the kind of notional context for people to be able to make their representations on the highway and the carriageways. So the, the bus station staff ought to be coming through in January with the rest of the, the kind of physical, they're all physical, aren't they? This is terrible. Um, the kind of landscaping sites to design. So we are potentially looking at um, removal and reinstatement of the existing shelters, improvements, green roofs. There's all sorts of things been mooted. Um, but again, they need to go through various kind of checks and balances before that's something that we would be comfortable putting in the public arena. Um, so it's half right, but it's mostly, no, how can it be half? It's half right, but it's, there's, there's more, the actual concept designs for that space are yet to come and they will be subject to separate consultation. Okay, so just to apologise, you might get some uh, negative parish council responses because they saw the plan of the shelters being divided up and immediately thought that was encompassing. So apologies for that. Um, and that was my error as well, but just to make you aware. All right, thanks. Thank you. 
Are there any final questions? If not, then I'd like to uh, thank Caroline very much and um, Councillor Cornell. And um, we will see you back in February. And it's good to uh, see so much has happened in, in three months as well. And but when we come back, then we should have more on the bus station. So, um, yeah, so we should should have more information on that and also then the um, designs in the beanie as well. Um, so that that's good to know. So I think all we had there was really um, the statues, anything additional and any of the extra work, if that's feasible um, to, to look at as well as we go along. So um, we're just noting this report as well. So is everyone happy with that? Yeah. OK, lovely. Thank you. Right. Well, uh, thank you, Caroline, although you're staying. So. We now move on to item eight, which is the half-year performance report analysis of the council's half-year performance. <laughs> and this is pages 57 to 77. And um, Caroline Marlow, Head of Digital Data and Improvement, will um, give the report. And we also have Gay Ma Guy Mayhew here, who's Senior Performance and Improvement Manager. And Councillor Hazelton is here on behalf of Councillor Dixie to answer any questions. So just to remind everyone, this isn't Councillor Hazelton's um, portfolio, but um, she will she has been briefed, so she will do her her best, but bear with her. And um, this again, this report is to um, note um, the report and the next stage is for any of our comments to go to cabinet. Um, and to provide then the um, annual corporate plan report in the first quarter, which comes back to us. So thank you very much. And you're do it, you're, uh, sorry, Guy, it's you, not Caroline. Okay. I'm sure Caroline will chip in if needed. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, the, yeah, so this report is the, um, this is in the last year of our current corporate plan, and this is the interim assessment, so the half year stage. Um, and uh, because it's the interim assessment, we've got a subset of the full suite of indicators that we would usually report back on. In the interest of pithiness and trying to trying to expedite the discussion, um, the the five core corporate plan themes that, that were adopted in the 2021 corporate corporate plan was growth, housing, clean, protect, and corporate principles. Um, during this period, at this interim stage, um, we've seen improvements over the duration of the um, corporate plan and we're starting to see those bearing fruit in uh, waste collection um, and we've uh, also along with at this half year position with some record performance in major planning applications being decided um, strong council tax collection in our housing aim um, but um, as I'm sure we're all aware, um, there's been industrial action affecting waste collection and there are some areas that need a slight course correction which have been detailed under the under the, the specific themes. Um, in terms of the specific themes, and just to just to go through the, the highlights on them, so on growth, um, as I mentioned, uh, major planning applications are um, achieved 100% outturn, so exceeding targets of both our SIP for near neighbours and geographical neighbours. Um, our economic activity proxy measures that we have, things like AMPR stays, um, we're seeing increasing stay times, which uh, is usually a, a, a co-measure of, um, of length of stay within the city and therefore economic impact. Um, we're seeing um, we've got less than um, less than the national average in terms of our employment rate, but mixed performance on that because um, according to our uh, SIPFA and geographical neighbours, we're lagging slightly behind. So when we bring back the annual report, we'll go into that in a bit more detail and provide some more context on that. Future is to look at rebaselining the target, seeing as the um, the, the continued success in plan, major planning applications probably is a time to review that. Um, and then, as, as Caroline's just mentioned in that report um, previous to this, leveraging the £20 million DLUC funding um, uh, to uh, to enhance our, our public realm and make sure that we enhance the offer in the city centre. Um, in terms of specific other other themes, housing, um, we've seen um, arrears, arrears levels have kept been kept low, and that's an area that consistently performs well within within that theme. Um, we're seeing um, issues with relets, re and uh, I'm sure when the housing report comes later this evening, there'll be some more detail on that um, and some slight slippage in our capital programme. Um, we, we need to focus and we are focusing on re-procuring contracts. So we've inherited the term maintenance contractor with housing and we're just about to go through a, a retender exercise and appoint a new contract. So that'll be hopefully we'll start to see void turnarounds in, improving and, uh, and there's some more detail in the housing report on that. 
under cleansing, obviously with the strike action, we've got limited data to be able to benchmark and compare against. But what we have done in this report is compared like for like the period where we have the data. So therefore it's not skewed by the strike actions and we're seeing, seeing improvement in that area. But there are some areas that we need to focus on and double down on such as street cleansing, where we need to use the data that we've now got um, access to and, and, and oversight of to, to, to improve the operations there. Um, overall, the, the report is, so it shows that the council's seen resilience and adaptability in the face of some of the challenges throughout the duration of this corporate plan um, and some key successes in areas. And we've got to continue, continue our focus on strategic improvement and addressing the areas of concern um, for the second half of this fiscal year. So I'm happy to ask, answer any detailed questions, but thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Castle. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if it's for this uh, committee meeting, but just a quick one on the planning enforcement. Obviously, you've got you know the cases that are submitted. I've got a couple of quite substantial ones in my ward. Is there a KPI accessible for how long a case is dealt with? Um, because obviously, I've got a couple that have gone on for quite a long time. I'd just be interested to see that data, um, if possible. Thank you. And um, on that on that point, Councillor Castle, as well, I was I had a, a similar query about the. Um, note here about the number of cases that have been closed and i know you're going to look further into that so so yes i think around planning enforcement um it would be interesting to know more thank you thank you for the question councillor castle so on um, planning enforcement, uh, again, when we adopted this corporate plan, one of our key themes is protect. And um, it's planning enforcement is a very difficult measure to have because it's not quite open and closed in terms of the case. It can often be quite complex. Often there's a need for negotiation. So it means that the, the, the case be, can be quite protracted. But again, you know, the, as, as a council, we need to do something early on to start that process because we don't want to exceed the, the um, I think, five year threshold when it becomes PD or permitted development. So that's an, in, in, in terms of duration of cases, we want to make sure that cases aren't being neglected. But, but measuring the duration or the average time of a planning enforcement case is very difficult to compare like for like. Likewise, when we looked at the indicators, open and closed shows a shows a, a degree of throughput or trying to you know, move those cases forward. But again, isn't an ideal metric in its in its own. It needs the context around it. So operationally, or, or within 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 the services, we look at that those kind of operational measures, things like average time that a case has been opened or when it was last interacted with. But it's very difficult to translate that into something that is then appropriate to put into a corporate plan performance report but i'm sure you know if, if, you, if you did want more detail on that we can um, refer that to our um, head of planning thank you um, yeah thank you i've been like i say involved in two quite complex cases and i can understand where you're coming but i think from from the you know you said about the pinter development rights which i know are going to be slackened so you know things can drag on for longer which is good for enforcement but i think the, the cases have highlighted in my world that the length of time it's dealt with it sets a precedent that you know build it first worry about enforcement later and that's i think be nice maybe as a sub note just to see average case length shared publicly maybe so people knew um so we can tell them that you know fundamentally they're more complex um, and I know the enforcement criteria is very slack and it's retrospective first and it drags on and it drags on. But, you know, I've got one case that's three and a half years now. Um, so it creates a bit of, yeah, it'd just be nice, I think, publicly for people to be able to see that if possible. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Castle and Peter. Yeah, the, um, the last administration, there was a, a council working group on plan enforcement and uh, Susie Wakem was uh, the lead officer for it. I know she's listening, so she'll be, she'll be going, oh, OK. So she'll probably pick this up with you separately anyway. But if there's anything on that around it, it is complicated and individual cases need to be looked at on a case by case basis. But uh, Susie in particular will be able to point you in the right direction or, or give you some specifics. But on the back of the working group, there was more resource put in, not just to plan enforcement, but actually the legal side some of it is about actually the, the legal side of it rather than the, the pure sort of specialist plan enforcement um, activity as well it, it would be um interesting though to also have more information next time on the cases that have been closed and why they've been closed and is the ward councillor notified that they've been closed as well i think that that would be really useful um councillor house first and then yeah Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Guy, for all of this. A lot of detail. Just I want to 
4.4 down to 4.4e, which is talking about fixed penalties. Be interesting. You've told us how many have been issued. Be interesting to know how many of these have been challenged and overturned. I think that'd be quite a useful thing to know. And also how many have been given out by our own enforcement officers compared to how many have been given out by the private company we have been using. If that's, would you have that data? Uh, absolutely, we have. I have that data at my fingertips. Um, not, not, not quite to be able to disclose that immediately, but um, I'll, I'll make sure that that's included in the next report. Lovely. Thank you. And Councillor Turnbull. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, one is about um, there were delays with the or a missed um, collections with the gardening waste, um, which it says that some of it was due to the delays for subscription stickers. I know there's a plan not to have stickers this year, and I'm wondering if that's going to make that smoother or if that's, uh, you know, if, if there are any concerns about whether or not that's going to have an impact. Um, and there was another one is uh, about fly tipping. The fly tipping cases for this year are quite a bit higher or quite fly tipping um, enforcement is quite a bit higher, um, given that we're only halfway through the year than it has been in previous years. I'm wondering if that's down to um, better work in finding culprits or is it uh, more fly tipping or do we not know? So, thanks. Um, Pip, yeah. Oh, that's okay. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I think that the answer to the fly tipping question, um, Councillor Turnbull, may be that because of the um, contracting out to NES for <clears throat> FPNs, that that has allowed the in-house resource to to focus on the uh, on the more complex fly tipping cases um i i believe that's the case i'm just going to look back at the officers yes i'm being given the thumbs up there by um, marie royal <clears throat> so i think i think that's the answer rather there may well be an increase um i don't know the data on that but certainly there's been an uh, an ability to to focus more uh, with in-house resource on on fly tipping cases and getting them successfully to court Thank you. And I think maybe on the green sticker, we can wait for the next report and or oh, go on then, Shark. Go on. Uh, I'll answer it now as it's been asked. Uh, we would imagine that, that 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 was part of the idea of streamlining the la no stickers. It's on the Bartek system. We know when you've subscribed, we, we don't have to rely on the stickerage to know. Um, the digital should do the job. So actually, in that respect, that should make the start hopefully a little more streamlined. Although I will note that, of course, we're not collecting subscriptions until a month later than usual because um, it, uh, as a sort of thank you to residents for bearing with us during the industrial action. Which is already causing confusion to some people, but never mind. Um, we can come to that another time. Um, Councillor Mellish. Uh, it may, there may be no answer to this, really. Uh, just, first of all, it's on the tenants' arrears. Um, and congratulations, actually, so pitching below the, uh, your, the the target figures um, but I do note you know that you're a very sort of a very ambitious target in terms of the 3.58% uh, in uh, 1920 oh sorry 2019 <laughs> um, we probably won't collect it in 1920 um, but then it starts to creep up you know even though you're even though it's below the uh, the, the target I just wondered is there any um, Obviously, 2021 is, is obviously uh, the, the pandemic and even running into 20, uh, 21, 22. Uh, we're now going above the, the 4% uh, mark. And I'm just wondering, is that down to individuals? Yeah, because it, it could well be. Just, um, one or two individuals whose rent's not being collected or are there other factors starting to see that, 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 that rise in, uh, in numbers? Um, sorry, I can't see quite through the pillar, so... <laughs> Oh, no, don't worry. Yes, no, no, Caroline had the same. It's Caroline had the same problem. <laughs> so um, I, I, I believe I believe the answer to this is partly due to um, the disaggregation of the East Kent Housing Service. So so obviously when you disaggregate a service that's solely focused on or one of their main focuses on on the economies of scale with rent collection is that is that you, you you lose those efficiencies or to an extent, but also you know in terms of the recent performance, obviously this is on the backdrop of um, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, and and uh, and obviously with with recent inflation and cost of living um, uh, challenges, so I think that's the the broader context there, particularly when when positioned against the 1920 performance. 
but I'm going to pass to Marie, Service Director. Thank you. Um, I think it's a mixture. Uh, I think a lot of residents are struggling. We know that there's been financial hardship. Um, we put extra resource into the money and benefit advice service that we provide. So for every tenant that, that moves in, um, the money and benefit advisors meet them. Um, they do a financial assessment. They help them maximise their income through various um, claims for different benefit. Um, and, and they sort of support them through the process. I think sometimes with, with the rent arrears, there's often a delay, especially where it's a universal credit application, where we have to sort of set up the housing element, then there's a delay and we've got to wait for the payments to be uploaded. But in a lot of the cases, you know, we are getting the housing element paid directly to us as a landlord, which, which you know, helps that sort of provision. We've got a really, really good, good team, a good team manager, um, and, and that shows in, in terms of the performance. But the most important thing is that if somebody struggles, it's about getting to them early. It's about making every contact count with our locality team who are out and about. And it's about at every point, council officers signposting people to the support that they need when they need it. Thank you. And Councillor Watkins. Uh, thank you um, and cheers for the report. I've got three questions probably to, uh, to, to, to different people. The, the first one was just clarification. The disabled facilities grants, there was a comment that we were recovering more than budgeted. So maybe someone could just, just explain what that, what that actually means. Um, second one is why are we not reletting our, our uh, housing stock more quickly? It looks like the, the, there's an increasing delay in, in uh, reletting because we've got, obviously got a huge backlog of people who want, um, you know, social housing um so so what's what means that we're not turning those around and getting people in really quickly because that's one one way that we can improve the situation without building more homes which will seem more 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 complicated and then the, and then the, the the final one uh, yeah obviously we we went from a world in which lots of people were dropping litter um and hardly anyone was being caught and fined because the numbers are incredibly low aren't they like just a few dozen a year so but we know that lots of litter has been dropped because we see it on our streets um we bought in the new system a couple of years ago and 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 you know a couple of thousand people a year are being caught and fined for littering um, and obviously that has some impact in terms of people's behavior and, and not dripping as much dropping as much litter but i think i, I read in the press that the the cabinet is now reviewing that with a view possibly to to stopping um the the scheme we've had in place for the last couple of years um with the with the uh the, the contractor we've got who, who who issues those fixed penalty notices so can i just check with with the cabinet member do you do you think it's a, a success that we're catching and finding a lot more people for littering and if, if you do then, then why are we looking to possibly um uh, uh abolish that system thanks Which one of you, Charlotte? It's it's um, Crapsula Nolan's portfolio. Um, but yeah. she, uh, um, she's not here. Um, do I do we think it's a success? Obviously, um, anything that acts as a, a, a the way it has acted as a deterrent is a success. But there are elements, and Councillor Nolan has said so in the press of some of the. Um, some of the enforcement which could be refined the areas which we target need looking at again should we be looking in prior should we be looking in supermarket car parks should we be refocusing on areas that perhaps have more asb and litter in the city center we're going to look to refine but um n n it is not our intention to um come out of the contract Thank you, Councillor Cornell and Marie. Um, just, just to add to that in terms of, of the contract that we've got for, for littering, um, 
We've got a really good relationship with the contractor. Um, our cabinet um, member is, you know, has made those connections. So there is a conversation happening between the cabinet member and the contractor. Um, we're able to target the resource, as, as Councillor Cornell said, at hotspots. So over the summer period, when you know things were um, sort of happening at the coast, we could target that resource to sort of seasonal uplifts and, and issues that were coming along. Um, from a quality assurance point of view, every one of the um, litter contractors um, where's body cam footage? Where's, where's a body cam? So any interaction with the public is filmed all the time. So where there are complaints, uh, we review the footage. We do that with the contractor. Um, we pick up lessons learned. We we you know look at the reason that the fine's been given, and we cancel it if it's not appropriate. Um, and and linked to that, it's obviously the learnings from the interactions with the public to make sure they're dealt with in a courteous way, that procedures are followed. So you know just to reassure you that quality assurance is in place. In terms of the disabled facility grants and the spend, it's normal for this time of year to be at that sort of mark. Um, we have a lot of projects with the disabled facility grants where we have to do a lot of the preparation work. So the drawing, the tendering out of works um, and getting things in place. The other thing to add for this financial year is that um, I think well into quarter the beginning of quarter two we're actually given more money from kent county council to fund disabled facility grants so again that sort of affects the percentage spend against the grant that we've got but you know as with other years we're really confident that with the demand that we've got with the resource that we've got and and the skills that we've got in house that that budget will be spent and spent in the right way to help people and the other issue about voids, so with voids, we've done a deep dive review into the voids. Um, it is touched on in, in the housing performance report. Um, there's a number of contributing factors in terms of um, the properties that are becoming vacant, the condition that some tenants are leaving them in is extremely poor. So we need to review our processes around inspecting the properties, making sure tenants are looking after properties and making sure that when properties are being left, if there is any tenant damage that actually tenants are recharged for that damage and held accountable for that damage. When you look at the voids and the level of works that's needed, um, often you have to have multiple contractors that come into a property. So obviously you need to do your rewiring before you do your replastering and that all adds time in terms of boy turnarounds and um, the other part of this is the fact that we're doing asbestos surveys when we get a void property and we do that on every void property to make sure that from a health and safety aspect the management of asbestos is, is managed in the right way again that adds time on to sort of void relet process um, Another challenge is around sort of meters and, and debts left on meters. We often find that tenants leave debts on meters. We need to clear those debts. That's negotiation with providers. That takes time. And contractors need an, an electricity supply, in most cases, to carry out the work. So there isn't one silver bullet. There's not one reason. Um, but as I say, we've done the deep dive into the, the void process, the management of voids. Um, we're in the process of redesigning the way things are done. And we are retendering our repairs contract, which provides for the repairs to voids. So there'll be a different method of, of contractor control in terms of moving forward from April in, in the turnaround times too. Thank you very much. And Councillor Hazelton. Thank, thank you, Chair. Just to, to add to that, because it may come up in, you know, the, in the housing performance report, I'm, I'm, it's a real focus um, for, for me and, and working with Marie and the officers about, about the voids, because 
apart from the loss of rent, you know, and the HRA desperately needs that rental income, it's a loss of a home to, um, you know, to people who, you know, we've got too many people on the housing needs register. So, so it's absolutely a, a focus. And the East Kent audit that was, you know, the deep dive that's, that's looked at that has come up with the recommendations. And, you know, I will absolutely be expecting to see, you know, improvements on, on, on this particular performance indicator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that OK, Councillor Watkins here? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Council Cornell. I think, I think broadly speaking, the the, the litter um, uh, enforcement we have is, you know, broadly working. And absolutely, you should always look to improve things, shouldn't you? So, if the review is to do that rather than to end it, then then um, that sounds that sounds positive. Appreciate the extra information on the disabled facility grants. That sounds good. I suppose the only thing I'd say about the voids is obviously all, you're doing all the right things, um, but. I suppose to, to Mary's point on, on it is the things which are causing the increase in these void periods aren't things I would expect to be increasing. So would we be finding more asbestos than we used to? I wouldn't have thought so. I would have been thought we'd be finding less asbestos because it's gradually cleared out from the housing stock. Are tenants damaging their property more than they used to? So they need more repair? I wouldn't have thought. People are more vandalous of their own property than they used to be. I, I could be wrong. Um, ditto the, 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 the energy meter uh, 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 issue. So I, all I was thinking is, like, what, what's driving those factors? Um, and, and is there something else at play here? But I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. And, and fundamentally, if you're aware of the issue and you're trying to get your contractors to tackle those various issues more speedily than, than than that's right but i think i think it's worth keeping an open mind what what is driving those underlying factors is there something else going on that we we might need to tackle as well but thank you for your answers thank you um do we have any final question i just had just before we go i just wanted to ask you um guy um about the lack of benchmarking to um, Thipfa and geographical, I can understand on some of them because they are very specific to Canterbury, but on others, is there any way that we can start benching those more so we know we know a comparison with other local districts and similar councils? Thank you, Chair. So um, the, the the challenge the challenges is that at this half year position. A lot of our SIP for bench benchmarks are um, going through the same process of providing these interim assessments. So, because the data isn't available as in in the public domain or, or accessible through benchmarking tools like LG Inform, which is what we use to collect and benchmark our data, it's not able to be benchmarked. But I think what we could do is actually in, at, at this interim stage is rather than benchmark the whole of the first year is maybe look at benchmarking up to where the benchmark is available. So, so then at least just to get a bit of a feel against comparative, similar to what we've done with, with the waste collection and street cleansing metrics this, um, for this report. Um, but when we get to the annual report, we've got, we've got more, more data to be able to benchmark and also to be able to smooth out some of those variances, seasonality, things like that, that could happen within our, within our SIP for near neighbours. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think that would be really useful. Otherwise, it feels that although we can compare over years, we're not seeing the fuller picture. So I think that would be really helpful. But anyway, I'd like to uh, thank you and Caroline for a very um, in-depth and good reporter again and for coming here this evening. Um, and um, so if everyone's happy with that, I don't think we've got anything particularly um to pass on from that uh but it's all minuted anyway and some of the um questions councillor watkins as well will be coming through in the next couple of reports as well this evening and it might be through those that we then want to make some suggestions of information to come back to us so if we're all happy on that noted yeah okay so noted uh right now item nine Contract six monthly performance report, autumn 2023. And um, this is pages 78 to 
87. And we're noting the report of the Director of Corporate Services and presenting this evening is Sarah Randall, who's Lead Contracts Manager and also present to answer any questions is uh, David Maidman, Director of Conenco and Malcolm Saville um, of Conenco. And we also have Councillor Cornell here as well to answer any questions. So um, if you're, if you're, I know you're just setting up, Sarah, no, that's fine. While you set up. And again, with this report, um, we're just noting it. And the next st stage in the process will be for Cabinet to review this report as well. And any comments that we have, um, they will look at again and review. So I think we're nearly there. Yes, thank you. No, no, that's all right. No, we've had to have a shift round of the furniture for anyone listening in. So uh, <laughs> I think we're there now. Um, OK, thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah. Sorry, this report is the six monthly um, contracts report um, that I bring on a six monthly basis. It covers the four main contracts that are managed by my team, which includes the waste collection and street cleansing um, operated by Kanenko, the grounds maintenance and associated works again by Kanenko, the public toilets cleansing and maintenance contract, which is currently <coughs> with Monitor, and the building cleaning of the civics buildings, which is with town and country currently. Um, the data provided in the report includes the two additional um, data sets requested by this um, subcommittee in uh, last meeting. So it's got the additional fly tipping and the play areas under the waste um, collection and street cleansing and the grounds maintenance contract. Um, I've got a verbal update on the play areas because the data that was put in here for um, the last peer, the last month um, didn't have some cases closed on the system. We can only close the, the cases on the confirmed system when all costs are associated with that. <coughs> and the team leader responsible for closing and adding all the costs was um, unfortunately off on sick leave. Um, so he has now updated all the records. Um, and as of today, um, I'm pleased to report that there's only 81 cases that remain open on the play areas um, with 28 on um, hold. The on hold cases are where it requires a full replacement of a item um, or working with the parish councils where um, we do the checks on behalf of them. Um, and um, I'm aware that the play area capital is being looked at as part of the budget setting process for next financial year. So there's a hope that some of the 28 cases that are on hold currently will be worked on next financial year. Um, but also the, my environment team colleagues are looking at Section 106 funding where appropriate um, and other funding opportunities to um, reduce that list of 28 cases. Um, and I don't think I've got anything else to add other than the graphs and the KPIs are there for um, your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, before we move on, I just wanted to note as well that um, Mary Royal, who's Service Director of People, is also a Director of Conenco. Um, just so we note that. Does anyone have any questions or comments on the... Yeah, Councillor Prentice. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to see the fly tipping data um, in this report. Um, my question, I suppose, is around the uh, target for removal of fly tipping. Obviously, this table here explains the percentage that has been removed. What is the time scale for removal of fly tipping or excess waste now so sometimes i think it, it's difficult to de to decipher what is excess waste and um, that's just built up and obviously then there there may be reasons why excess waste is built up with the industrial action over the summer 
um, are we still see, are we still seeing some sort of residual issues as a result of that industrial action? and a um a backlog of the removal of fly tipping um i speak from experience in my own ward where we've had some some quite um ugly scenes with regards to fly tipping um that uh we've had about four five six weeks of fly tipping um not removed um and in in quite heavily used sort of you know areas where people are depositing their waste from in in, sh in blocks of flats so i just wondered what that what that sort of target was how are we doing against the backlog is there a backlog um and are there any residual issues still from the industrial action no um as far as we are concerned actually during the period of the strike they actually managed to catch up a lot on fly tipping cases because they still had people working that could drive that size of vehicle what they were struggling to man was the larger vehicles um, and therefore they actually made a really good effort over the strike period to catch up with some of the backlog which is why the percentages went up to 86 percent and 82 and a half percent of collection they will only collect land um fly tipping from council land or on um highways land um so i'm i'm not sure if the cases you are talking about are were specifically communal bin areas in which case that's not fly tipping that is communal bin waste so it won't be captured in this and we need to look at that in a separate issue were they were they council communal bin areas or were they private communal bin areas? Yes. Yeah, so these were uh, council bin areas on both one occasion actually um, before I was elected, um, and the most recent one was cleared last week, both on the Spring Lane estate. So I appreciate it's not fly tipping. Um, the residents will probably still call it fly tipping because all they see is an accumulation of rubbish. And um, you've probably got a more technical term for it, but um, it looks terrible. And often it seems to crop up in some of the same places, which could make residents feel like they're being forgotten about when they raise it. And only when I get involved do issues get resolved because the online process doesn't, they feel the online process doesn't, work for them i'm not saying it doesn't work but sometimes they feel it doesn't work for them so i just i don't know if there's a way of that it might be too granular to accommodate in this report but i i think it's it's a really just a a way of i would like to just address that in with my question really because i think i don't think that always gets picked up in the data that's presented Yeah, I mean, it won't get picked up in the data because it is the communal bin areas and therefore it's not defined as fly tipping as fly tipping is defined. Um, I can look at the cases you particularly and, and work with our housing colleagues about whether there's some additional signage or letters to the local residents we need to think about, whether there's sufficient bins in the bin stores and those sort of things. So. If you could drop me an email with the specific addresses and locations, then I can look at those specifically with Kenenko and housing colleagues to resolve them. In terms of the backlog. Thank you. Um, Councillor Howes first and then. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the report, everybody. I've got an email from somebody. I'm sure it was sent to yourself, Sarah, as well, from somebody who lives in Canterbury Fields within my ward. And I sent him a report because he was complaining about quite a variety of different things. I don't know if you, did you see it? And he's responded to me and it says that it's very frustrating what's going on. I, like many of my neighbours, now have no option but to put all of our recyclable items in the blue recyclable bin unsorted. Has nobody at the council within its operative workforce realised that this is happening? Canterbury Fields cannot be the only place within the Canterbury jurisdiction which has ended up like this. He also talks about Nobody in this estate 
has had any food waste because all of our bins have either been lost because of the wind or damaged by the staff. And he just really wants some answers. He just feels that the report doesn't reflect what his lived experience is. So I don't know, I've sent it, Charlotte, I'm sure I've seen it. I don't know if you've seen it, Sarah, as well. It came in over the weekend, it was sent to the council. I'd just like some answers for this gentleman so we can actually try and find out what's going on. Because if this is true, which obviously you've got the bar tech system, you'll know and you'll have all of the data and you've got all that information, it'd be nice to actually get try and get to the bottom of it. That was all. Thank you. Sorry, it's hidden. It'll either be with the localities team or with um, other colleagues in my team. Um, it isn't a case that I'm aware of, so leave it with me and I will pick it up tomorrow and find out who's investigating it. Um, yes, I, I, want, I think that's a, a good point on that, though, that doesn't show up in here is on some of the food waste collections and then the where we've gone from the red container the red insert to a red container or a red bin is how rapidly we are replacing missed items or broken items because it's not just that one case i think probably all of us have cases where people are waiting very long times um, for replacement bins and then you get cases where people just never receive anything at all so i think it would be quite interesting if we could if we could look at that as well in terms of how long does it take to actually replace um missing items um whether that's in terms of them having a free one because it's been broken or the ordering because i know some people are still being told it's seven weeks um to get a replacement bin and the issue in that time is they start putting everything in one bin because they don't have anywhere else to put it so i think i think that is something that would be be interesting to know and before i come to councillor castle just on that point as well is assisted collections um I've had a whole load at the moment, but that goes back quite a long time, I think, with assisted collections and issues with people not having any assisted collection, even though they're on the system. And I wonder, again, if we could have a look at the number and percentage of reported missed assisted collections and how we're doing with those, please. OK, so firstly, on the bin deliveries, um, Yes, we're working with Kenenko. We also started a conversation very recently with um, the digital team about whether we can be smarter in updating the information on the website to, to let people know actually what a realistic time scale is at that time. So, for example, we know since the leaflets went out at the beginning of last week, we have the demand has just gone through the roof. So um, Kenenko are currently working on how to resource getting those out um, by a third party to make sure they're out before the Christmas rush because we are desperate. Now the leaflets have gone out to make sure they're out. Mm. Um, but yes, we can pick up some um, reporting information on that for, for, for future. On the assisted collections, um, post the strike, we have been doing a lot of work with Kenenko, with the crews, um, to make sure that they are aware of where the assisteds are. Um, it's been um, one that we've been had, had on our radar, and it is one that we are working very strongly with at the moment to make sure that we get the crews following and picking up the assisted collections so we can do some figures on that again in future but be assured that both of those issues are being looked at currently um, by um, Kenenko management and ourselves to find solutions thank you and um, Councillor Castle I hope I didn't pinch your questions <laughs> Uh, no, that's okay. I've got um, three items there, KPI related, really. I know you helpfully spoke to me before, Sarah, about bins, all glamorous stuff, obviously. Um, but I do like the data. Could I ask three things? Um, I agree with Council Apprentice. Could we have the data for the average days from report to removal for fly tipping? I just think that's a really important KPI just to see, because parish councils particularly, and that shoehorns into another thing particularly I wanted to ask, um, is about the reports. I know it says on there 
that you've got the data for cases that are mainly duplicates and not fly tipping? Could the data be shared for ones that are reported that are private land? I've got a lot of farmers that have sites that people report and then it's declared as private, so obviously it won't be done, but it'd be really good to get a handle on how many, I know the numbers there, but how many are not duplicates, just drill down into it really, because um, I've got a lot of sites in rural areas where the farmers remove it, it's never reported and it deters them from reporting it. Um, and I'm I'm really obsessed with the website and the map. And I did speak to Peter at one point about the map not working and it was working. Um, so yeah, it'd just be nice to see, you know, just to encourage people to report them even incorrectly, but then we could see that data. So we know there's, you know, 400 private properties that we, we wouldn't remove, but that then tells us a real picture of, in, of places where we maybe need to still target. And the last one would be maybe to see the data, not maybe in this report, but separately to councillors of by ward. Um, I know, you, again, you've got the map, which I'm constantly on, but it's very difficult to access over a time period how many reports have been in my ward. And um, it'd just be nice to see that if possible, not to give you more work, sorry. I will work with colleagues in both digital and um, enforcement to see what data we can get um, and look at adding some data, um, not at ward level. And I can sh look at what we can do with digital and share that with you in independently. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't looked at the data as to how we can drill down and provide that. I'm looking at Peter to see if he knows off the top of his head, but I think he's looking blankly at me at the moment. So we'll, we'll look into that. But on the um, enforcement and the private cases, I will ask them to start providing me with that data so that we can have that for you as well. Peter. Yeah, I think just on the um, the, the purpose of some of these reports, because you're, you're sort of seeing today's one of those really... You know, everything comes at once evenings uh, and you're seeing lots of the same sort of data reported in slightly different ways because it's being used for different reasons. The purpose of this one in particular goes back a long time and it was about trying to scrutiny sub or the, the committee that existed at the time, being able to do a bit of a deep dive into what they saw at the time as the key issues for, for that contract. And we're going back to when it was Circo, so a long, you know, relatively long time ago. If we keep adding to it, you're going to get more and more information and find it harder to actually see through it. And we, you know, I'll probably start charging people rent for being in here because we're going to be in here a long time if we're going to get into every single sort of metric that you can you can look at on the Kinenko contract. So I think probably towards the end end of this time, it'd be really good to sort of try and get an idea of the things that you're you're now interested in as as a committee. Because I think Sarah needs to go away and look at what what goes in, what goes out to give you a better idea of the sort of things you're interested in at scrutinising what Kanenko are doing through the contract. Um, but what we don't want to do is give you every single thing because you're just going to look at it and go, well, there's another thing. And then it's going to get sort of all beautiful mind and there's going to be links between all sorts of things. And we're, we're all going to go slightly mad trying to sort of manage the contract through a, a six monthly report. And that's not particularly the, the aim of this. It's to be able to go, what are the things that you're particularly keen on? And particularly why we bring Kanenko into this one is so you can go into that deeper detail. But what we don't want to do is next time bring those new information and then you go, actually, now what we're interested in is something different because you're not going to be able to follow it through. So I think that there's a few things that come up tonight, which are things that we can definitely go away and see if we can pull through. Um, but to do that, we're going to have to sim down some of the other stuff. Otherwise, you're, you're going to end up so much information that it you can't give the scrutiny role properly you know, in, in the same way as what you want to be able to do on the performance one and the performance data that you saw earlier can also pick up some other stuff so it, you know it's an opportunity maybe just to sort of do a bit of a hard reset on that um, and also it can take say a, a good month or so to pull some of this data together because of the way we have to go through and, and pull it out of systems so it can take as long to write the report as it as it does to bring a report through for, for you to look at so if you have got those sort of things I think it'd be good if we can capture that Rachel towards the end and then we can sort of go through that and if that's okay with Charlotte that might be a better way of trying to sort of bring bring what you're interested in as a committee rather than what we're interested in possibly as officers or or previous um previous iterations of this committee yeah no thank you I think that's a good point I think we can we can do that um certainly when we get the annual report and the other thing I I think might make sense as well is that um, the minutes from this item go to the Cabinet Committee or, for Conenco, if that's possible, so that they're able to see what we've been talking about this evening and then maybe raise some things from that that go to Cabinet as well, rather than we're in isolation, because there have been some good things raised this evening and 
for anyone that's not here that's going to be on that committee, which is on November the 30th, um, it might be useful them, for them to know what we were talking about this evening as well. Do you think that's possible? I mean, it's, it's definitely possible because it's, share, it's sharing data between, yeah. between committees. I think it's more what the remit of the Cabinet Committee is in terms of it's uh, to, to scrut not scrutinise, to, to check the, 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 the sort of delivery of what's being delivered by Kinenko as a business as opposed to it as, as a provider. So that's more sort of management accounts and it's sort of, you know, structure and that sort of, side of things. So, yes, this can be shared, but I wouldn't... I don't think that's within the remit of that, that the cabinet committee to scrutinise the performance of the business. That, that's the but it might just committee. be interesting. It, yeah, they, they can to, see it. Yeah, yeah for sure. To, but to consider that yeah, as well, what we've be been talking about, and then we can look at KPIs as well. And the other thing I was going to say, um, coming back on Councillor Castle's point, is that if you look at something like the KCC pothole map, that's very useful because it shows you where everybody's reported on that map and i agree with fly posting fly um tipping that you go in and you report it and then you get something back to say somebody's reported it but if you saw it on the map in the first place and it would give an idea then of how long it had been there so i think it would be quite useful i think there are other ways of showing that information yes councillor castle the, the um the data is on the map you can go on the live map it doesn't always work though um, but you can see the case and when it's reported and everything at the moment. Um, but I think it was more just not having to look at a map and zoom in and out, even a postcode list, and then I'll work it out, you know, and that's not necessarily this committee. It's more just because as a parish ward particularly, they're all very hot and they feel like they're being left to deal with some of those, especially some of the landowners, and they are, that's the rules, but it'd be good to see that and then quantify it so then at least it pushes it back you know it's that's the rules we can't help that you know um and i, I just would like to add that might been arrived very quickly when i needed a replacement so thank you um but i everyone who reports it online that you know that i think the Kaninko team have done a really good job in my rural ward with since the strikes um you know and the data is very you know tentative and a couple of residents saw it and is can be a bit boring um for some but they have i think the performance has been good um and i think that's good from an environmental point of view with fly tipping etc so thank you yeah i i agree with you and obviously fly tipping is something that really um affects a lot of people especially in rural areas so um i think i think that's a good point so when we get to the um year um we can we can look at adding those oh, that those in then so councillor yeah, no, it, was, it was just sort of on the reporting again, but more reporting on missed bins. So when I'm, so I'm told that when the bins are reported missed, that's as sort of far as the information that the resident will receive. And then if the bin isn't then picked up, then they try to escalate it and go on to the council website and then they get the automated email saying 14 days. Mm. So that exasperates the problem even further. So I'm just wondering, is there a way that you could just email the resident back and say your bin will be collected within sort of five days rather than I get the when I ask, I'll get the email back saying it's been added to our missed bin list and then it still might not be collected. And then, you know, they have to take, depending where they live, they might have to take the bins in and out all the time. And I was just wondering if there was a way of just giving them a rough date. Thanks. Um, the whole of the, the whole of that process is currently sort of under review because there is a, a myriad of different issues. Um, there are some challenges with resourcing missed collections each day. So what was missed today? Also, a number of missed bins are being reported where we haven't been able to gain access, and there are issues within the system which is allowing people to report a missed bin, where because we can't gain access and we know we can't gain access that should prevent them and give them a message to say there are access issues today, your bin hasn't been collected, please leave your bin out. We are having a number of, there is a percentage of failures on returns for missed bins because of the residential challenge of being able to leave that bin out, which we understand, but that doesn't actually help resolve the issue of the collection. Um, and it, and it's, it's an ongoing, and particularly in the city centre, where that is, that is a fundamental problem. So. If we were able to return the same day, if we were able to return the day after, or we were returning two days later, those issues would still be there because certain residents will take their bins in. And when they bring, put them back out the following morning, there are 
inconvenience issues of being that on the pavement and they're probably thinking i'll put it out the same time as in the time of my collection whereas a miscollection crew wouldn't wouldn't be operating in those same time parameters so there are there are some certain challenges there are as i said with the access issues there are um issues within the system which we're trying to resolve so the crews will also report each day a number of not outs what we would call not outs where the bins are not presented that statistic is currently running at around 20 percent of collections each day which is a phenomenally high number but the challenge bit and that is for different reasons again people forget people are on holiday but again when the crew report that as not out the resident can still report a miss bin so all the miss bins that you have are unqualified unsubstantiated and without sort of jumping around going back into the corporate kpis when you come to benchmark against other authorities they won't be benchmarked against other authorities because they will only report sanitized numbers so because their service criteria or sla is if we haven't been able to get to your property today we haven't missed your collection and their service slas may well be you report a misbin within so many hours and we have so many hours and days to collect it so it's only reported as a misbin if you don't collect it within the two or three days after your misbins after the report we are you are reporting and what you are seeing is a hundred percent warts and all so it's not comparable comparable data when you come to benchmark yeah so yeah i so i do get that because you know obviously i suppose it's the same with the sort of the green win green bin collection you know you could get it get it emptied and then quickly fill it up again and say it hasn't been that collected happens too. but however it's you know it's not always that is it so i'm just so my, 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 my question was is there a way of telling residents it would be collected within x amount of days or because you know i know there's like you know seymour road that you can't you know there, there was a thing that they wanted to put some yellow lines up there so the bin lawyers could get up but then reject the residents rejected that idea um but you know some some people won't are, are genuine and that's that i suppose that's a hard thing isn't it you know you you're sort of tarring everybody with the same brush but yeah so is it is there a way or not i think the the solution would be is we need to review what's on the website in comparison to what we're achieving i think there was probably a trying to manage expectation the sort of the 14 days or seven days is probably a little bit now overstated and again people say oh, it's a bit unrealistic so we need to look at what are we achieving within that given period with an aim to review that on a monthly basis so if there is potentially a slippage or we have something bad weather or interruption then you, you get a genuine get genuine reason but it's as important for us to resolve that as it is to resolve the digital issues as well that would provide the information to the resident at that time so they understand that actually they haven't been missed i mean we have quite a number of access issues each day which get which certain officers will see because we report that back through and that can result you know result or sorry result in anything from three six nine roads every day now some of those roads will only be six or eight properties some of those roads are 30 40 60 80 100 properties but we don't have a communication process so that ability to communicate directly with the resident when that happens is again something that is being looked at but it's sounding and i do understand because this is all linked into the part of the digital conversation digital argument and it does sound a little bit like a lot of jam tomorrow but we don't have it at the moment so how do we the practicality of miss bins emailing each each individual person i don't think is a, is a practical solution either for us or civica so the important bit is we get that message better that is currently being fed back to them automatically no thanks for that. i guess it's yeah just make reduce a 14 day message <laughs> peter yeah i think some of that messaging is left over from from how we came out of the strike action and, and making sure we weren't over promising on the back of trying to do a recovery so again like david said we can do some of that and change some of that information but ultimately we're not amazon we're not going to give people a you know a window of two hours and say when stuff's going to take a photo of it and send it through to you but i would also say we're probably not as bad as every and some of the other ones but we're going to lobby being over somebody else's fence so we're probably trying to sit somewhere in between those those two extremes um and i think yes the technology is getting better um i think there, there probably are ways and we're already exploring some of those with kanenka around how we can sort of access some of the, the better ways of giving um more accurate information um but but ultimately it's you know it's 
it's a universal service um, and it is very difficult to, to provide a, a universal service with all of those sort of things where people have got to share their data with not just us, but with Kinenko. They may opt in, they may opt out, and therefore universal service very quickly becomes something where some people are getting something different to, to their neighbours um, because of their own personal circumstances, um, ability to use technology and other things. So we need to, we need to look at it in the round. Um, but there definitely are some some things coming through to to help this uh, as as we progress. Thank you, and I think that's the thing. The, the The whole thing was just to get messaging out there, wasn't it, in the beginning, so that there was something for customers, and and now that one size doesn't fit all. So it now needs refining and becoming more specific to those people. Because I think what often happens with missed rounds because of blocked roads is that if a resident's gone off to work in the morning and comes back then in the evening they don't even know there was a blocked road and I, I find that over and over again that um you know if if you're not about you don't know what's going on in your road and then you think your bin's not being emptied so even the, having that information would be interesting for someone so I think I think that's um that that would be good um and just connecting up on on the digital there um so if we do we have any final comments or remarks on that report no well then i'd like to um thank you very much sarah and uh malcolm and david for being here this evening and also um councillor cornell thank you for your time as well um so um, we have a few things then to resolve. We want to have some fly tipping KPIs, um, assisted collection, uh, communal bin area tidiness, food bins, and then we have some specific queries for Councillor Prentice and Councillor Ho has to be addressed. And then we'll bring those back at the annual meeting and we will have a look at those KPIs and if we want to adjust them and um, what makes more sense for us now. Um, so if everyone's agreed on that, yep, okay. Thank you very much. Right, okay, we're nearly there. <laughs> so I don't know if, I, does does everyone want a two minute break just to grab a glass of water or are you all okay? Do you want to carry on? You want, you're showing signs you want to go and get something. Okay, we'll just have two, literally two minutes then.
Right, is everyone is everyone raring to go? No. <laughs> raring to go, yes. Yeah. Councillor Watkins, Councillor Franklin. <laughs> I know. Two minutes. Next not, time. Yes. <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> right. Thank you. We're all back for the next two items. <laughs> Um, so, item 10 is the Housing Performance Half Yearly Report, pages 88 to 100, and um, we're noting the report of the Service Director for People. Um, presenting is Mary Royal, who's Service Director for People, and also present to answer any questions is um, Alexis Jobson, Head of Facilities Management, and Councillor Hazelton is here to answer questions on her own portfolio. Um, Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, some of the performance indicators we've already covered through the, the corporate um, performance reporting, so I'm, I'm not going to recover those. I think it's worth noting, obviously, from a capital spend point of view, we are not forecasting that we're going to spend the full budget. We're thinking at this stage it's going to be around three million. Um, part of the reason for that is, as we have already covered in terms of the stock condition surveyors that we need to recruit, um, we've got one stock condition surveyor in post now who's doing a sterling job and doing as many properties uh, as they can. And we made the conscious decision to actually inspect as many of the properties as we can to get as much data as we can so that our future work programmes are based on sound data and we can get the best value that we can for, from projects. Um, part of the underspend for this year is, is around 1.8 million that we're going to roll over in terms of the external wall installation work that we need to do. Um, at Windsor House in Whitstable. Um, what I would say is that Alexis's team have done a, a, a grand job in terms of completing a number of the capital projects that, that they had um, in their plan for this year. Um, in terms of compliance, again, we pleased with the progress on compliance. There was a bit of an issue in terms of the reporting data um, because we were recruiting to a post. The data was still there. It didn't affect the service provision. It didn't affect business as usual. It just affected the, the, the actual reports that were being produced. And compliance remains our ongoing priority in terms of our tenants and our stock. Um, from a repairs point of view, you know, Mears didn't meet the performance target for routine repairs, but they met all the other targets that they had. Um, swell heating didn't meet the performance target on the appointments kept, but met all of the performance targets. Again, we swale, it's a new contract, things are bedding in, and we're confident that the contract management that we've got in place um, it is effective and, and can pick up issues earlier. We've touched on the voids. What I would say is that as part of this report and what we, what we will be requesting from Cabinet is um, approval to actually change the void targets to make them more realistic. These are going to be interim targets um, for up until March, the end of March, and then we will be revising them again, as I said earlier, based on the contract that we let for our repairs. In terms of letting that contract, um, we, we've, we've started the procurement process and we're actually shortlisting and scoring tenders this week. Um, and that new contract will apply from the 1st of April. Um, we've already covered the, the, the good performance of, of the um, tenant arrears team. What I would say is that garage arrears is also done by the same team. They have rightly prioritised um, tenant arrears, uh, but the indication is that from a, a garage arrear point of view, um, we will be uh, a good position by the year end. Um, I think the, the biggest area and, and my biggest concern um, from quarter one and quarter two 
is again around complaints. It, it's around turnaround time for complaints and the responses to complaints. What I would say is that when I've looked at the data for the complaints and the complaints that are late for quarter one and two, it's a different profile of complaints than we had last year. Last year it was around repairs and tenancy. This year it's actually the housing solutions team who have got the highest level of complaints and the highest level of complaints outstanding. There are a number of reasons for that in terms of you know, high number of approaches of, of homelessness, um, people are staying in, te in temporary accommodation longer um, as, as we try and find more permanent housing solutions for people. So from a caseload point of view, cases staying open longer and officers have an increased caseload as a result of that. Um, what I have said and, and what we have agreed to do is a deep dive into housing solutions. Um, we're going to look at how that team is operating. We're going to look at training. We're going to look at processes and we're going to do a redesign of the processes um, to, to try and uh, make that more effective. Um, Similar to the voids, obviously we've done the deep dive, we've, we've identified the issues and we're going to continue with the service improvements around policies and procedures relating to voids. Um, I think I'm going to stop there because I, I'm, I'm sure you all have lots of questions. Um, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, very much. Um, are there any questions? Councillor Howes. Thank you. It's a really good report, as, all, as usual, and it's good to see improvements continuing to be made. If you think about where we were only a few years ago to where we are now, the whole team need to be really, really proud of all the hard work they've put into it. Just one thing I would like to see, if possible, next time is a bit more information about temporary accommodation. Because you've said that there's a lot more people going into temporary accommodation because the demand is increasing. and. Anecdotally, we get told that people are being moved quite a long way out of the area. I've been told somebody was offered Durham, and I don't know if that's true or not. So I think it'd be nice to know how long people are spending in temporary accommodation and how much temporary accommodation is within district, and also how much is going out of district, and if so, to where, so we can actually keep an eye on that. Because obviously it's important to keep as many people in temporary accommodation within our district, because they have so many needs within our district and it's where they education is perhaps the most important for many of these families and the family supports so i just think that's something we need to monitor and keep an eye on and as you said i think the only disappointing part of this report is the complaints process and procedures and i know there's reasons for that but it would be nice if we can start to see improvements i'm sure the audit shows ways out of it because i know that it's it's problematic for all of us as councillors and also members of the public who are in, only come to us when they're very worried and they expect us to be able to pick up the phone and deal with things instantly and they get as frustrated as we do. So that's it. Thank you. And Councillor Mellish. Thank you very much. Just on, uh, excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat today. Um, on, on asbestos, um, I just wonder how, I'll get back to Councillor Watkins' perhaps a, a query earlier uh, about housing stock. What sort of numbers are we talking about? Because asbestos you know, was stopped being used in housing construction some 30 years ago. As, as somebody who used to take uh, asbestos surveys myself, when well, I worked for a local authority, yeah, um, that was back in the 80s and it hasn't been used since. So are we talking about um, a stock that's some 30, 50, 60 years old? Um, that, there's nothing sort of to say what sort of quantities we're talking about and why are we the housing that the stock is 50 years 40 50 years old as well do we have that sort of uh, those sort of numbers um i know that we are still finding asbestos and it's not uncommon to find asbestos in our, in our void properties um and as um marie explained earlier we do have to survey it quite quite often it's in ceilings that's one area where we find it um, so and, and floor tiles and things like that. So it is still present in quite a few of our properties and it, it, it does mean that we have to get those surveys done. Um, not I'm not querying that the, 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 the asbestos is in the, is in the property. Sure, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I would expect it, but how old is the property? 
when were these these things put up and what sort of quanti what sort of numbers are we talking about yeah, um, I'd have to come back to you on numbers. I don't have that level of detail of information, yeah. but, but, but we can. Just, just, no, just in terms of sorry, sorry, chair. But in terms of the report, it sounds as if there's a great number. There's a great bit, but much of resource being put into it. Now, mm. it may not be. You know, uh, to, 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 to trying to kind of quantify it somehow, uh, and also it's a reflection on the age of the housing stock as well, mm -hmm. and what we're doing to replace aged housing stock. Sorry, sorry, go. Um, thank you, Chair. Well, what I'd really like to see is the whole of our housing stock being, you know, either beautifully retrofitted and carbon neutral, lots more of it, and a lot of brand new stuff that's built to, you know, the, the highest, you know, new environmental uh, standards, um, you know, tomorrow, obviously. Um, but the reality is that we do own over, I think it's well over 5,000 uh, properties in our housing stock, and a lot of them are of older construction, and they are going to be a challenge to, you know, to, you know, to get to the, you know, retrofitting. Um, and we're doing what we can, and as, you know, at the point that we can acquire new properties um you know as soon as we can and we're in a position to do so we'll absolutely be uh, be doing that it is one of my uh, big ambitions if i can ask you for those sort of numbers but what sort of numbers are we talking about uh, in terms of what's um been been type of houses been surveyed and how many come fall under the, the need to have asbestos removed Yeah, we, we, we can get that data and bring that bring that data um, to to the next meeting. And and just leading on from what Councillor Hazelton has said, um, obviously, you know, our ambition is to um, increase our stock and improve the quality of stock. And in addition to ageing stock, we've got a number of non-standard properties. Um, that, that's in our portfolio. So, obviously, at some point in the future, you know, with the, with the new council ambition to increase um, new stock, then we will be looking at disposal of um, our worst performing stock or stock that we no longer feel is appropriate or suitable um, for, for housing provision. Is that okay, Councillor Mellish? That information that that would be great. Just um, as somebody who's you know, fully, who worked on the, on, on asbestos regulations you know, in, in another world, as it were, and who's dealt with asbestos in his working life, I am concerned that it seems to be quite a, a major part of our our work in this area. I just want to get quantified on it. That's all. Fair point. And do we have anything else on housing? Um, I have a couple of things. Then um, I think it's good to note the improvements in lift and repairs. Um, can you update us on water hygiene though? Because there was a arrangement due to be completed in October. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, that's been completed now. Lovely, thank you. And um, I think the real thing, as Councillor Howes also mentioned, is the complaints. And I hope that there's been a, an improvement already. I think, I think whatever you're doing, I wondered if you could just explain what this new process is that you've implemented, because there does seem to be a little bit more of a, a change in the responsiveness, but I agree with Councillor House. By the time people come to us, they're usually incredibly vulnerable and at the end of their wits. And I think therefore, you know, we do need to have that rapid response. And when you get a reply back to say, you'll hear something in 10 days, <laughs> it's quite disheartening. So I just wondered if you could update us on that. Thank you. Um, what I would say with the complaints is that we, we have a dedicated um, officer within our case team who sort of coordinates the complaints, fills them out to officers, chases them up. So it's really important that if you've got a customer complaint, that you check with the customer first that they've actually made a complaint to the council, get them to send it into the service issues inbox. Um, 
and then obviously that team can field it, they can track it, they've got a clear audit trail of when it came in and, and whether or not we've responded in time. Um, similarly, if you, know, if you as councillors want to escalate anything, do it through that service issues inbox because again it's that clear audit trail it doesn't get lost in anybody's personal inbox and then you're waiting for for responses and and feeling frustrated as with our customers so i think you know the improvement recently is that we've recruited to that post and that's happening um but you know as I've said before, we've sorted out the other team where the responses weren't happening and, and we weren't getting that. And it's with another team. So we're about to do that service redesign with the new team. So by the end of year report, we'll be able to feed back on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And anything further? No? Well, then I think um, what we need to do is note the report, but also feed back any comments to Cabinet on the new void performance targets. So um, perhaps council, from Councillor Watkins two reports ago, can we take those comments and put them in here as well to go to Cabinet on voids and also Councillor Mellish? So that was particularly on what are the issues in the voids because it you know asbestos is an old an old thing now or goes back to the 80s when it's no longer been used and as councillor watkins was making the point you know on meters and behavior um are those getting you know why why is it getting worse what are the symptoms um because there must be some underlying there seems to be some underlying factor there that maybe we're not necessarily getting to grips with or or to us it's difficult to know what we're getting whether we're getting to grips with it so that would be useful uh, councillor watkins do you want just just going to say I mean, why why not just uh benchmark if that data is available with the other districts because that you know that would shine quite a light wouldn't it on um on on, on whether we've got a, a, a problem or actually it's just something that's county-wide and you know we can do relatively little about it yeah that's a good point yeah Oh, yes, thank you, Chair. I, I, just, I, I do take your point and I kind of agree with it, but it, it's making me smile because in another report you were saying don't compare with other districts. <laughs> so, so I'm just making that point because actually I do agree with you that, that comparative data I think is actually quite helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think they're slightly different <laughs> things, though. We just want to be the best at everything, Councillor Hazelton. Um, Marie. Um, we do have comparative data available for our neighbouring districts with voice targets. You know, each of them sort of reabsorb the social housing and they vary from district to district quite significantly. But what we can do is give that data to Cabinet and that comparative data so it can be taken into consideration lovely thank you very well very much um so if that's that's all okay vanessa yes you've got that yeah you've got that all done so um is that noted everyone okay with that fine so noted right okay thank you very much marie alexis and councillor hazelton i'm afraid you have to stay for another one um <laughs> yes yeah although yeah we'll see how we go um right so uh moving on item 11 is the revenue and capital second quarter half year actually isn't it budget monitoring forecast report and that's pages 101 to 118 and um to note the report of Nikki Mills, who's also presenting this evening, who's the Service Director, Finance and Procurement. And Councillor Hazelton is here to answer any questions, but I also remind everyone that um, um, she is here on behalf of Councillor Sol, and therefore it's not her portfolio, but she's happy to have a go at answering some of the questions. Otherwise, um, Nikki Mills will do that as well. Thank you, Nikki. 
Thank you, Chair. Last but not least. Uh, yes, this is the half year forecast report for the General Fund and the HRA and um, very kindly Alexis and Marie have also stayed behind just in case you've got any questions for them as well. Um, so for the General Fund, just to give a bit of an overview, we're currently forecasting an overspend of just under 800,000. Um, at this stage in the year, it's not unusual to forecast an overspend. However, this is slightly over what we how we would like to see it at this point. Um, so we are continuing to monitor um, this closely and prioritise spending and, and ensure this outturn doesn't result in a higher overspend or, if anything, we can bring it down. Um, some of it is due to inflationary in impacts that are just coming to fruition now in contracts and utility costs and, and those sort of things. Um, a significant part of this is due to the uh, there is a Riverside project that, that it's slightly delayed in the timing compared to when we what we set the budget as. Um, for the rental income. So although that won't change this financial year, it will for next for next year and the income will be coming in in full for next year. Many of these variances, they are already included in the draft budget for 24-25 that is currently out to consultation. Um, and we're continuing to check all of that to make sure that any unavoidable costs are built into to next year's budget. Uh, for the HRA, the forecast is again, very tight um, and currently projecting a small overspend of about 87,000 to draw from the working balance reserve. There is a lot of work to be, there is a lot of work being done to manage this and manage the cost and prioritise the spending with weekly meetings and monitoring to manage all of this very tight budget and parameters that we have. Um, and there's also the capital is included in this report for the current year's budgets. For general fund, there are some, only a few minor underspends and overspends, but no significant overspends to report on the overall projects um, at this stage to report. And then for HOA, there are some overs and underspends on each of the lines. And as already mentioned in the previous item, uh, the forecasts have even been updated since this report was compiled because we're doing that weekly monitoring. So it's continually changing with updated information. But also mentioned in the previous report, the uh, underspend on external wall insulation, they stole my thunder on this one. <laughs> uh, the external wall insulation is still progressing uh, and it's just the timing of it when the spend will happen um, rolls over into next year after all the procurement process that we're going through. Um, so it still is happening. Uh, but just rolling into next financial year. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Does anyone have a question? Yes, Councillor Mellish. This is going to be very parochial, I'm afraid. Um, and it's about the bandstand in Herne Bay, uh, which comes under the contracts uh, forecast overspend of uh, 366,000. Um, it says that the now the outcome of the Herne Bay LUF bid is known to have been unsuccessful. Well, in fact, we know that the third, also the LUF uh, stage three has been withdrawn completely, isn't it? So we're not going to get anything through LUF this um, this time round. The band said well, we would need to be re reviewed further. Um, is there a time scale for that? Because the the band band said is suffering from concrete cancer, and the cancer will not stop for our review. Um, and we need something in, in place uh, to uh, to uh, so assuage. The uh, the, the uh, decease of the or the uh, the the breakdown of the, of the bandstand. Um, any ideas when this might happen? Yeah, it's something that's been raised just recently, having known that we we've not got the funding for it. So um, it's something we're working on. We have already done some work on the bandstand. We've got costs that we put together previously. In fact, pre pre-LUF um, and the LUF was kind of came after that and so we wanted to wait to see what the outcome was so we have got a lot of information already we're starting to pull that all back together and we'll report that on that as soon as we possibly can because I think we're all very aware that, that needs progressing. If that could be shared with the, I mean obviously I'm a Herm, Herm Bay councillor but also with the two other um, uh, Heron Ward uh, councillors would be um, uh, Councillor Thomas and Councillor Harvey where well, Liz Harvey would be useful. Thank okay, you. We will give you an update as soon as we can. Thank you, Councillor Mellish. Do we have any? Yes, Councillor Tim. 
Thank you. Um, you say that uh, this is a slightly more than um, usual at this time of year, and I don't really know you very well, so I don't know when you say slightly, whether you're just sort of actually it's quite a bit, but I'm just, you know, or whether it is slightly. I don't know what what would be sort of expected to be at this stage. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I suppose I do mean slightly, uh, because uh, this sort of time of the year, it can be forecast in half a million pound overspend would be normal and then it would come in underspend because quite often people are forecasting prudently both in the income that they're forecasting that it won't might not be you know they don't want to overestimate on income um, but then they also might be prudently forecasting the expenditure on the other way um, so we're continually trying to get it as accurate as possible, um, but it, it's a natural in the, in the first stages of monitoring throughout the beginning of the year, it looks like a huge overspend because everybody just forecasts the things that they know about on expenditure. And, and, and as you go through the year, you get more information um, and more accurate data that then you can use that as your forecasts. Um, so yeah, I, I say I do say slight overspend and it's probably like, 100,000, 200,000 at the max that I'm thinking it compared to previous years at this stage, um, it can be a forecast overspend, but it doesn't mean it always is. It's just it's something that we need to manage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I just, um, I the one thing I wanted to ask about was the um, charges and fees are down in the first half. Do we have any information on why those are down? I think I'm right in saying that. I can't remember it, can't find it now, but I'm sure. <laughs> but we can always we can always look at it afterwards. There was something in there. I just wondered whether it what it was that was impacting on there, but we can always look afterwards, don't worry. Yeah, I'll have a look through the report what, to where we're referencing that and I can reply on that. Thank you. And anything else? We're all happy? We note that report? Yes? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, um, Nikki, and thank you, Councillor Hazelton, as well. So, um, with that, uh, date of the next meeting, you'll all be pleased to hear, is Wednesday the 28th of February 2024. So you get a nice long break off for Christmas at 7pm. And uh, there's no other urgent business to be dealt with in the public, so we don't need to exclude the press and public. And there's no other urgent business. So um, thank you all for your patience tonight. I'm sorry that was a very long meeting with a lot coming through to it. Um, and thank you to all the officers and thank you to the Cabinet members as well for being here this evening. Um, so we'll reconvene in February. So um, I'm sure we'll be at other committees, but I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs>